Assalamu alaikum. Welcome everybody on Learning Curve platform. We are very happy to invite you for our lecture, MRI Joint, reading by Dr. Ahmed Al Jafri. Dr. Ahmed Al Jafri currently working on King Fahad Medical City in Riyadh as a consultant and head musculoskeletal radiologist. He also have he has two fellowship on University of British Columbia and Vancouver muscle skeletal imaging and emergency trauma radiology. He also has fellowship on muscle skeletal radiology on King Fahad Medical City in Riyadh. Dr. Ahmed Al Jafri, you are more than welcome. You can start your uh, lecture right now. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my voice is clear, hopefully. Clear. Okay. Uh, thank you for the organizing committee chaired by Dr. Abdul Malik on this uh, kind invitation for uh, this topic. Uh, hopefully we'll uh, spend a pleasant evening together uh, getting a run on, on uh, basic uh, MRI reading. Okay, the outline of my talk, uh, we're going to be basically uh, going through some basics before we uh, embark on uh, uh, reading uh, joints and spine. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, to uh, mention a few basic things about MRI equipments and MRI physics, recognizing the basic sequences so you will not be feeling overwhelmed when you look at uh, an imaging study. Uh, basic relevant MRI artifacts, particularly pertinent to orthopedic practice, basics of MRI safety and uh, some common questions that we get on a daily basis. And then we're uh, gonna raise awareness about the American College of Radiology appropriateness criteria for MRI use. After that, we'll go through the joints. So basically how MRI works, to, to, put, to put it very simply, we exploit the hydrogen atom, which is present in abundance in the body we subject this hydrogen atom to a stronger magnetic field. Then we play with that magnetic field through magnetic gradients in order to elicit uh, signal from these uh, uh, atoms using magnetic resonance. So on every MRI system, there is a strong magnet that we put the patient inside and then we said because this strong magnet is a permanent magnet, all of these atoms will align with the main axis of the of the magnet. Then we uh, excite these with radio frequency pulse in order for these specific atoms to go against the main uh, the main uh, magnetic uh, axis. After that, we turn off the magnet and then the hydrogen atoms, or we turn off the radio frequency pulse, then the hydrogen atoms are gonna return back to the main axis. And as they return back to a lower energy state, they're gonna lose energy. And we see it as an MRI signal, which translates through some sort of calculations into an MRI image. So, um, in every hospital, probably you'll see an MRI magnet that looks like this. This is the closed bore system, okay? Um, something very relevant for orthopedic practice and, and musculoskeletal practice in general is the availability of high quality coils. So think about the coils as if you're having uh, a lens in which you see structures magnified to a better extent. So the function of, the, of these coils, these coils are radio frequency coils, right? Remember the radio frequency transmitter. Uh, this can be either in the sides of the bore of the magnet or adjacent to the structure of interest. So the closer you have it to the structure of interest, the stronger the signal you're going to have from this. So we have dedicated wrist coils, dedicated finger coil, dedicated knee coil, dedicated shoulder coil, and the boot coil that we use for ankle and foot imaging. Why this is important? Because most of the hospitals, unfortunately, tends to cheap out 
on on buying these dedicated coils because these cost money, right? The price that you get for ordering these or having these in your arsenal as or or in your in your equipment is better quality image. When you whenever you have a better quality image, you're gonna have a much better diagnosis. So probably you have heard about these kind of magnets. Uh, some imaging companies they tend to to uh, uh, market these as uh, friendly for for the patients who are claustrophobic. This is a basically a closed or an open MRI. So for the open MRI, in comparison to the closed bore system, this one is very very small hole, and most of these patients will become claustrophobic from going inside. For the open system. Basically, we'll have two plates parallel to each other, and the patient will have nothing on the sides. They claim that that the patients will have much more uh, pleasant experience, and those who are claustrophobic will be able to to tolerate uh, the uh, the the scan. From my experience, if the patient is truly high, uh, claustrophobic, even an open MRI will not do the job. And sometimes we resort to imaging them under general anesthesia. Okay, what's the problem with these open magnets? So remember that we, the, the 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 main bore contains a very strong magnet, more than the strength of the magnetic field of the Earth itself. Okay, usually we'll hear us calling or saying. Uh, the, 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 there is a, a 1.5 Tesla magnet or three Tesla magnet. What's the difference between them? The higher field strength you go, the higher resolution images you'll get. The problem with these open bore magnets is that the, the, the maximum strength is one Tesla. Okay, what's the problem with these? Low resolution. What's, what's the problem of re low resolution? Low resolution means a poor diagnostic quality scan. Actually, in our hospital, we had one of these, and thank goodness that we got rid of it and had a better quality scanner. So another basic thing for radiology, you'll hear about something we call the imaging planes. A sagittal MRI or a sagittal sequence or a sagittal plane or a sagittal image, coronal image, transverse image. Whenever we see it plainly without uh, having a modifier like oblique or or uh, double oblique, then we refer to the main axis of the body. Uh, please, if you have uh, questions, we'll 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 have a um, a recess for for questions if if the. Uh, Committee agrees. Okay. So this is a sagittal image through the knee. This is a coronal image through the knee, right? You will hear us always also say this is a T1 or a T2 image. Basically, when we say T1 or T2, we refer to the behavior of the hydrogen atoms during the relaxation when we turn off the radio frequency pulse. So how to recognize the basic sequences. This is probably one of the most important slides in this talk for basic MRI reading. So T1, basically everything, everything that contains fat or hemorrhage is white. Okay, we use it mainly for anatomy to identify the bones, to identify the subcutaneous fat. And the T2, we, we always use it with the fat suppression to differentiate between fluid and edema because both of them will have a high signal intensity. High signal intensity means it's white on the image. So how to recognize the basic sequence? So first of all, what I like to, to always say, look at the subcutaneous fat, okay? If it's white, it means this is either a T1 or a T2 image. Okay, then look at an area that you would expect to see fluid, CSF space, joint space, tendon sheath, bowel, bladder, etc. If it's low or dark, that means this is a T1 image. 
if it's white, then this is a T2 image. Okay? طيب. Most of the pathologies are accompanied by bone marrow or soft tissue edema. Soft tissue edema will have the abundant fluid. So, and the fluid will look bright, meaning white. So, how to differentiate between white signal that comes from the fat and white signal that comes from fluid? Basically, we tell the MRI machine, please do a fat suppression sequence. Okay? So, this is a T2 image, T2 fat sat image or stair image. In this kind of images, we look for pathology. So again, look at an area that you'd expect to see fat. Where? In the subcutaneous tissues. Here, it's dark. Then this is a fat suppressed image. Then look at an area where you would expect to see fluid. The joint space, CSF space, uh, bladder, bowel. If it's white, then this is a T2 fat sat or stair image. What's the significance or use for this kind of images? is that you localize pathology. You see pathology in this kind of image. There is one more sequence that we sometimes do in orthopedics and musculoskeletal imaging, uh, what's known as gradient image. Basically, for this kind of image, we use it to accentuate the signal or increase the signal that comes from the cartilage and blooming artifacts or a signal coming from calcification or hemorrhage, okay? So this is probably the three working horses that you see us always perform in orthopedic or musculoskeletal imaging. We have a T1. We have a fat suppression fluid sensitive sequence of some sort, either T2 or STER, T2 fat sat or STER, and then a gradient for the cartilage or calcification, okay? So T1, STER, and gradient. Nearly always, almost all the MSK sequences for the knee, the shoulder, all of them contains these three basic sequences. Five. So let's recognize this sequence. Let's look at this image. Look at the subcutaneous fat, it's dark. Then look at an area we'd expect to see fluid. Like for example, here the joint space, the bursa is white. So this is a T2 fat sat or stair image. We look for pathology on this sequence. Five. Let me draw your attention to two key differences between these two. Sometimes the, the degree of, of brightness of T2 image or T2 structure differs in terms of the magnitude. Like for example here, this is a supraspinatus tendon. Here, it's bright, but it's not very bright, okay? Compared to the adjacent fluid in the bursa. Well, in this image, this is the tendon, or what's left of it, the supraspinatus tendon. And here, the continuity of it, we see area of fluid-like brightness. So this is a tendon tear, and this is tendinosis. The difference between tear and tendinosis is the degree of brightness that you see on uh, fat suppressed fluid sensitive image. Okay, this is a very basic stuff and very practical. Five. Basic MRI or relevant artifacts that you would always see. There, are, there is a lot of MRI artifacts, okay? Forget all of them and keep three things that is very relevant to orthopedic practice in your mind. Motion artifacts, metal artifacts, and magic angle artifacts. Because these will have a diagnostic utility. Like motion artifacts usually doesn't have any diagnostic utility, but it rather obscures seeing pathology or seeing normal structures. Like see, for example, this is a sagittal image of the knee. Okay. What kind of sequence is it? Look at the subcutaneous fat. It's dark area of fluid, joint space is white. So this is a T2 fat sat or stair image. Then can I assess, can, can I really assess the, the uh, anterior cruciate ligament here at the mid sagittal image? No, because of motion artifacts. Okay, usually our technicians uh, try to solve this by calming the patient down or applying proper padding 
around the patient or the structure of interest, and probably that will eliminate the, the emotion. If not, due to uncontrolled uh, motion from the patient, then that's, uh, that's our limitation, unfortunately. Then the second artifact that is very relevant to orthopedic practice is the blooming artifact. Remember, I told you that each MRI sequence needs to contain one of th three sequences. One of them is gradient image. Okay, what's the benefit of gradient image? It will, will increase the signal coming from, sorry. It will increase the signal coming from fat, uh, from uh, calcification, and increase the signal coming from hemorrhage, and also increase the signal coming from tiny metals, okay? I hope the, my voice is clear now. Yes, it's clear now. Okay, excellent. Type. The, the gradient image actually sometimes tell us the, the area of previous surgical intervention. Like for example, if you have a patient who is referred from an outside hospital and you don't know what kind of procedure that the patient underwent due to, for example, poor uh, accompanying report, then one of the tricks that we use is to, look, uh, to, to do a gradient image and look for the blooming artifacts. Usually, whenever you use a drill or, or a, a uh, um, orthopedic equipment, it, it is uh, shedding some sort of tiny, uh, tiny uh, foci of metal. These foci of metal produces the mag magnetic susceptibility artifact or blooming artifact. You'll see it as dark dots on these kind of sequences. If the patient did not have any previous surgery, then if you see an area of blooming artifact or low signal intensity, it means one of two things, either calcification or hemorrhage, okay? How to differentiate between both? Simply look at an X-ray. Calcification will be very apparent or readily apparent on X-ray and hemorrhage will not be visible on X-ray. Another, this is a this is case I had it last week. Uh, this patient came for an MRI shoulder. He had a previous surgery outside, and you can see he had a, a previous uh, labral repair with poor documentation that the patient came with. We didn't know what the patient had or underwent in terms of surgery. All we can see is the areas of blooming artifacts. Okay severe distortion of the signal at the area of the previous surgical intervention. But how can we problem solve this? Since we can't really do MRI, simply we can do a, a modality called CT arthrogram. We bring the patient, we inject the joint with iodinated contrast material, and then we perform a diagnostic scan. You can see clearly here there is significant medullary sclerosis with a concave contour of the anterior inferior labrum. Here you can see that there is some sort of low attenuation tissue in the surgical defect, likely representing granulation tissue. Another patient I had this week, you can see here, this is a sagittal T1 image. How did I know that this is a T1 image? Basically, look at the subcutaneous fat. It's white, then and an area of fluid, dark. Then this is a T1 image. I look for anatomy on this. And this sequence here, this is a coronal image of the knee. Subcutaneous fat is uh, dark. At an area of fluid is white. Then this is a T2 fat sat or stair image. What I can tell you is that this is a poor quality examination. Unfortunately, any patient that goes into the magnet, we interrogate them regarding the presence of metals or previous surgeries. Why? Because of MRI safety. Like this kind of distortion happens only with the presence of ferromagnetic substance, like for example, uh, iron fragments, okay? We brought the patient back and had an X-ray for his leg. 
you can see here the soft tissue shrapnel. Okay, so this was uh, an unfortunate case and probably a very hazardous for the patient because these can fly off and have a missile effect and uh, extrude outside the patient because we put these patients in, in a very strong magnet. The third important artifact for uh, orthopedic practice is what's known as magic, magic angle artifacts. So basically, when we put the patient inside the magnet and we image a structure that is oriented approximately 55 degrees to the main axis of the magnet, then these structures will produce a signal due to uh, magnetic field in homogeneity. Okay, so if you don't know about this, we're gonna overcall areas of tendinosis. Like for example, in this patellar tendon, we, have, we see area of increased signal or whiteness. Is this tendinosis or normal appearance? No. We do a T2, dedicated to T2 images or heavily weighted T2 image, and we see the disappearance of this signal, denoting the, that the presence of uh, magic angle artifact. Okay. So again, to recap, the three most prevalent or relevant MRI artifacts to orthopedic practice is motion, metal artifacts, and magic angle artifacts. Hope this is clear. Basic MRI safety, any patient who has a cerebral aneurysm, metallic uh, foreign body in the eye, shrapnels from bullets as we've seen recently, incompatible neurotransmitters, incompatible cochlear or cardiac implants, or pacemaker device, or prosthetic heart valves, then we cannot do MRIs. What we can do, we can do an alternative modality. Either we do ultrasound or we do a CT arthrogram or CT myelogram if you wanna read the spine. The, uh, the MRI compatible metals, although these will produce some sort of artifacts, but less than that of, of uh, ferromagnetic substance like iron, titanium is uh, MRI compatible, aluminum is MRI compatible, brass also is MRI compatible, will not produce uh, hazard on the patient, but will de slightly degrade the quality of the scan. Sorry, Dr. Ahmed, yes. to, uh, to interrupt you, but there are some questions you need to answer. I will uh, read it for you, okay? Okay, I will, I will just uh, uh, leave them until I finish this section before we begin the joints, okay? Okay, so okay. 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 Uh, if you have, uh, if you don't know what kind of... Uh, um, uh, of compatibility of your devices have with MRI, very practical website that they have a very big database for the, uh, the equipment and their compatibility with MRI. It's called MRI safety. You can search the, the desired equipment. Are they MRI compatible or not? Right. What to order when? This is a very common dilemma that we face in our daily practice. Like for example, in this patient, well, uh, unfortunately, I've seen some hospitals perform lots of MRIs on these patients. So basically, what we see here is collapse of the medial TB femoral compartment with a bone-on-bone -on -bone appearance and a genovarus alignment. I know this is not a whole limb standing radiography, but grossly, you can see that there is genovarus alignment with advanced osteoarthritis. What's the additional benefit of MRI uh, in this case, unfortunately, nothing. Okay, usually these kind of requests we re receive it from family, family uh, physicians. Okay, and and others who are not who are very well versed in in in, in uh, musculoskeletal care in general. Yeah. So would I do MRI for these patients? Unfortunately, no. Why? Because this will a way uh, will be considered a waste of MRI slot. Okay. Because unfortunately, our MRI slots are very limited, not unlike CT scan. CT scan, this, the whole study takes probably two or three minutes 
as a total in comparison to 20 to 30 minutes per case for for uh, for uh, MRI. So we have to be quite selective in, in choosing our patients. So this is one of the the efforts that was put by American College of Radiology. And it's very, very good to know if you're confused about what kind of imaging study is deemed most appropriate for your particular clinical problem. It's called uh, ACR appropriateness criteria. And uh, they have compiled a very huge list of, of uh, appropriateness use of imaging modalities across all, all specialties, not only not only uh, orthopedics or uh, rheumatology, but every clinical specialty, okay? And you have it here uh, explored it by procedure, by scenario, and by topic. Another thing for the basics, uh, the normal tendon, because as I said earlier in this talk, the, that we exploit the hydrogen atom in, in the patient, when generating the MRI signal, okay? So the behavior of hydrogen atoms depends on the nature of the, of the medium that the hydrogen atoms are in. If these are tightly bound together with a fibrous tissue, they will not produce any signal. Like for example here, look at the Achilles tendon. It is dark or low signal intensity means that the MRI machine did not detect any signal coming from this structure in comparison to the fat in comparison to the medullary bone marrow but notice here even the cortex because you have tightly bound hydrogen atoms it will be dark i.e it doesn't produce any signal compare it to pathology here this is a t2 fat sat image okay uh, you can see here that there is a fluid where you would expect to see a normal achilles tendon signifying the presence of tear. Again, tendinosis versus tear. Tendinosis is going to be looking at as an intermediate signal, gray on a uh, T2 fat suppressed image, while tear will look very white like a fluid on a T2 fat sat image. Pipe. Uh, also, generally speaking, in, in musculoskeletal imaging, we grade the injuries into three grading system, a magnitude of three. Either it's mild sprain, in which we see edema around the structure of interest, or grade two, in which we see increased signal intensity inside or brightness inside the structure of interest, and grade three, in which we see complete distortion or discontinuity of the structure of interest, okay? You'll see it very commonly in, uh, in all tendons or ligaments. We grade it in, in, in magnitude of three based on this kind of classification scheme. The bona fide example for it is the medial collateral ligament. So this uh, structure is the MCL. You see edema on both sides. This is a grade one injury. A grade two, you will see thickening with intermediate signal intensity inside the tendon substance itself. And grade three, you will see focal discontinuity manifested as an area of fluid or a gap in the structure. Okay. So I hope this will, uh, this kind of you know, basic notes um, uh, raised your interest a little bit in, in and radiology. So we'll answer a few questions before we jump into the, the joints. Yes, doctor. Type. Low Starting resolution, by... low resolution. Think about it, the difference between the CRT image and uh, 4K, 4K TV. Okay, the, the how, how sharp you perceive the image that's what we mean by resolution. And basically resolution is the ability to differentiate two points on a single image, okay? I don't know if you remember the, in back in the old days, we used to have a CRT TVs, you know, the hunched back TVs. You can actually, you can't see any, any features in, in, the, in the, for example, the anchor's face, right? 
while now with the 4K TVs and 8K TVs, you see every detail and everything. That's what we mean by, by resolution. Contraindications for MRI, I mentioned it here, basically. These are the contraindications for MRI. You have cerebral clips aneurysm that are MRI incompatible. Uh, metallic foreign body in the eye, for example, if the, page, if the patient was uh, uh, working in heavy machinery, if the patient underwent any previous bullet injuries, gunshot wounds, this is a uh, MRI, uh, income, uh, MRI contraindication. Uh, presence of, of uh, additional devices in the, inside the patient that are MRI incompatible, like cardiac pacemakers, prosthetic heart valves, neurostimulators, cochlear implants, but in the, in the, in the newer stage or newer generation of, of cardiac implants or cardiac uh, devices, you can have an MRI compatible devices. So before requesting or thinking about MRI, I uh, uh, always urge you to check the compatibility of the, of the device with the, with the MRI and the database that I provided for you. Blooming artifacts, type. Blooming artifacts are special to a, a sequence called gradient image. Okay, what's a gradient image? Uh, through basic MRI, basic MRI and complicated MRI physics, we tell the machine, please accentuate or increase the signal that comes from uh, three structures, from calcification, from hemorrhage, from metal. Okay, so how, how does it look like? It looks an area like an area of darkness, similar to the air outside the patient, like this here, like this, like this. Like what's the difference between MRI and CT regarding time consuming? The difference is very huge. Although MRI techniques are now becoming much more faster than it, what it used to be, but the routine, the routine MRI, for example, knee that we do in our institution takes from 15 to 20 minutes, okay? Compare it to an acquisition of probably 15 seconds or 30 seconds that you have on a CD scan. So the, there is a huge difference in terms of acquisition and how fast we can obtain the images. That's the difference between the time consuming. What's the difference between CT scan arthrogram and, and, uh, and myelogram? So the, 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 uh, basically there is no difference between them because these are two different entities, right? Two different modalities. Um, like for example, in this patient, here who had the metal artifact in the, in the area of previous surgical intervention, I recommend it to do a CT arthrogram, okay? An arthrogram basically is, is, is the time where you inject the joint of the patient, then you image him. In the old days, it used to be imaging them with, with conventional imaging modalities like X-ray, but now with the advent of cross-sectional images, you can do it with, uh, with uh, uh, CT scan or, or do it with MRI. If MRI is con contraindicated, then you can do it with, with uh, CT scan, as in this case. A myelogram, basically you do an LP, but instead of drawing uh, CSF fluid, you inject adenated contrast material with a certain dose that permits opacification of the central canal. And actually I had a couple of patients who had uh, MRI contraindications presenting with back pain. Then uh, a CT myelogram was very helpful to, to clarify which discs were compressing the which nerve. Like magic angle. Like, uh, what is it? So magic angle artifacts, it's very peculiar to structures that curves approximately 55 degrees to the main axis of the MRI, okay? Why it happens? Because of the local field inhomogeneities. 
طيب what are the structures or the tendons that are affected by this two very common uh, the uh, supraspinatus tendon can be affected by magic angle artifacts and patellar tendon how does it look it looks like an area of grayness احنا قلنا grayness or or increasing intensity it means that this is a uh, t- could be tendinosis right then if you uh, know that this is a met- uh, magic angle artifact you'll not overcall it overcall a normal structure as tendinosis difference between t2 and uh, t1 and t2 image the difference between them is the utility or the 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 use of the sequence like for example this is a t1 image we basically use it to to characterize anatomy to look for the medullary fat to look for the general anatomical structure and then t2 it's basically to you want to hear the signal that comes from fat and fluid to look for pathology but you cannot unfortunately differentiate between fat and fluid until you do a fat suppression sequence you tell the mri machine please ignore the signal or the the brightness that comes from fat and only show me the signal that comes from fluid i hope that was clear Any question? Any other questions before we jump to the shoulder? Okay, it seems that there is no more questions regarding the, the basic uh, stuff here. Or jump to the shoulder. Hi. Um, the outline of this. We're going to basically jump straight forward to, to MRI. We're going to see uh, notable variants that we encounter in our uh, clinical practice. We're going to mention a couple of artifacts. Basically, we're going to repeat what we said in the earlier talk. Then we're going to see some pathologies. Rotator cuff, frozen shoulder, lesions of instability and innervation around the shoulder, as well as the AC joint. So. Uh, remember that the the uh, we have the imaging planes that uh, we have uh, we can call our uh, our MRI sequences with. We have the sagittal, have the coronal, we have the axial images, right? But what's special about the shoulder? What's so special about it is that it's oriented 45 degrees to the main axis of the body. Okay, so uh, a true shoulder imaging. You need to, to orient your scanning planes uh, in, a, in a true coronal image to the shoulder itself. So uh, this is a, uh, if, if we obtain the, through the axial images, a coronal oblique image, we'll have a true coronal image of the shoulder. And this is gonna be res- the resultant image. A true sagittal image will be through the linohumeral joint, will give us a true sagittal image. Why this is important to know, because unfortunately, sometimes we see imaging that comes from the periphery and you have the planning wrong. If you have the planning wrong, then you cannot really make an accurate diagnosis, okay? Uh, One of the notable variants that can mimic superior labral tear is the sublabral recess. How to see it? Again, what is this sequence? 
could be a T2 fat sat or an MRI arthrogram. In this case, it was an MRI arthrogram because it was labeled as such. This is a superior labrum, right? Triangular structure. And we have seen, we see here a signal or white signal that undercuts the superior labrum and it is medially directed towards the patient head. And this is a normal sublabral sulcus compared to sublabral or superior labral tear. Usually the high signal is going laterally away from the patient head. Pitfall that I just mentioned is the magic angle artifact. Two areas that are commonly affected by it, supraspinatus and uh, supraspinatus and patellar tendons. How to see it? You see it as an area of intermediate signal intensity that mimics uh, tendinosis, but when you do heavily weighted T2 image, then the signal is gonna disappear also, if you don't see any, uh, if you don't have a T2 weighted image, then you look at it, you try to cross reference this with the Sagittal image. If you don't see it, then this is a magic angular artifact. If you see it, then this is a true tendinosis. So, pathology type. Usually, uh, the commonest indication for, for uh, shoulder MRI imaging is to investigate the status of the rotator cuff and the presence of impingement. Usually impingement is a clinical diagnosis. It's not imaging based, uh, basically not an imaging diagnosis. Um, and and we, how imaging can help by finding a cause and looking at the complication. What are the commonest causes for uh, common causes of impingement? We have osseous, pigmentous, and variants that can cause impingement and the complication by uh, diagnosing a rotator cuff tear. So, osseous outlet and acromion. This is one of the areas that the risk factors for impingement. The rotator cuff is surrounded by a bony arch. Uh, can cause mechanical impingement that leads to degeneration of the cuff. The anterior acromion is the most important structure that leads to impingement. And these are the coracoacromial arch made by the acromion and coracoacromial uh, ligament, in which under which the uh, supraspinatus and infraspinatus pads to insert in the greater tuberosity of the humerus. Okay, this is a normal osseous outlet. This is a sagittal image. How to know that this is a sagittal image? Look at the coracoid. Coracoid is always anterior. This is the acromion, and this is the distal clavicle. Here we see the supraspinatus and infraspinatus heading towards their attachment on the greater tuberosity of the humerus. So one of the risk factors is the acromial shape. In the old days, this was first depicted on lateral radiography of the shoulder. It has been classified as four types of acromial morphology, either a flat undersurface, type one, concave undersurface, a type two, a hooked uh, undersurface, a type three, or a convex undersurface, type four. Usually the commonest causing uh, impingement is type three and type four. It's an example of type one. You see, like in the old days, uh, they, they first uh, described these on, on sagittal radiography or lateral radiography. We diagnose these now, nowadays in a sagittal MRI uh, images. Basically the uh, outermost, or the first image that you see from the sagittal for the acromion is the one that you describe the acromion morphology on. This is a type two in which we see a convex undersurface. And this is type three in which we see an angle or a hooked anterior margin. And this is 
a concave undersurface or convex undersurface does not follow the same concavity of the of the uh, humeral head, and this is type four. Type. How to draw the line? Basically, instead of drawing lines, I always look at it, at, at it as a reference point in terms of the humeral head. If it follows the, the, how the relationship is related to the humeral head, like for example here, this is a concave and follows the concavity or convexity of the humeral head, and this is type 2. If it's parallel like this in comparison to the humeral head, and this is type 1. If it has an angle like this in comparison to the humeral head, and this is type 3. If it's uh, convex like this instead of being concave, then uh, it's type 4. Okay. Your internal reference in this is the shape of the humeral head in comparison to this undersurface of the acromion. No? Like the acromial downstoping. So basically, the main axis of the acromion follows the main axis of the humeral head. You know, in the previous talk, in the previous section, we described the acromion morphology pertaining to the undersurface of the acromion rather than the outer aspect or the main axis. Now, if we look at the main axis, we can determine the slope of the acromion in two planes. Uh, in the sagittal image, we can determine if this is downsloping or anterior downsloping. As in this case, it's an anterior downsloping with a convex undersurface. Okay, so this is an anterior downsloping. Anterior downsloping will have also an increased risk for rotator cuff compression. And then on the coronal image, the main axis of the acromion should be in the same line of the clavicle. If there is an angle between the, the, the acromion and the clavicle, the clavicle should come like this. Then the acromion, main axis of the acromion should continue with the main axis of the clavicle. If it's going down, then this is a lateral downsloping, and also this will have an increased uh, risk of uh, compression. Acromial spur is one of the risk factors for also acromial uh, uh, rotator cuff compression. Basically, we differentiate it between the deltoid tendon by the presence of the medullary marrow within the osteophyte. Basically, any osteophyte needs to have a cortical and medullary continuity as if you're dealing with an osteochondrome, but it happens at the margin of the joint. One of the variants that can cause uh, impingement is the presence of uh, ossa chromiali. And you have like four types, but generally speaking, we collectively plumb them into one category, is ossa chromiali. And usually these will fuse by the age of 22 to 25. If it persists beyond that, we will have an area of increased mobility and probably compression of the underlying uh, rotator cuff tendons. Like, for example, in this area here, you see a dark line going through the top of the AC joint. So this is an axial image, T2 fat sat, showing an area of edema in the AC joint and a pre the presence of low signal intensity line. This is more than 25 years of age, and this medullary cavity of the acromion should be in continuity with the spinous process of the clavicle, of the uh, scapula. If you have an additional line present, then this is an os acromiale. Another feature of os acromiale, if you have a double AC joint, you can see this also in, on, on radiography. Again, double AC joint signifies the presence of osacromial. Right. 
again, presence of double AC joint, one here and one there. And this is os acromialis type. Let's go again to the basics. What kind of sequence is this? This is a sagittal image for the shoulder. What kind of sequence is it? Look at the subcutaneous fat. It's dark, so this is a fat suppressed image. Then look at an area of fluid. Like for example, here the bursa contains fluid. So this is a fat sat, T2 fat sat image. Why we use it? To look for pathology. So we have two AC joints. This is an area of os acromiale. Here we see the supraspinatus tendon. It shows an intermediate signal intensity or bright brightness less than that of the adjacent fluid, signifying the presence of tendinosis. Again, a quick recap, chromium, we have four types. Uh, we have anterior lateral down stopping, we have the subacromial spur and the presence of os acromial. Um, additional structures to look for is the coracoacromial ligament. Basically, you look at the low signal intensity structure that connects the acromion to the anterior part of the, uh, sorry, the uh, coracoid to the anterior part of the acromion. This is the coracoacromial ligament. Normally, it should be less than three millimeters. If it's thick, it can also contribute to compression of the underlying rotator cuff tendons. AC joint can also contribute to compression of the rotator cuff tendon of the, if you have capsular hypertrophy or you have inferiorly directed osteophytes. As in this case here, osteophytes are going posteriorly and you can see, appreciate here, that this is the myotendinous junction of the supraspinatus tendon. And there is a dip here in the, in the middle signifying the presence of mass effect. For AC joint injury, as you all know, probably we have six grades, but for MRI, uh, we see it also always as, as edema on both sides of the joint with surrounding capsular edema. Depending on the degree or the grade, you, see, you will see variable degree of displacement, depending on the adjacent ligamentous injuries. A common thing that we see these days is the distal clavicular osteolysis. Basically, we have bone marrow edema limited to the distal clavicle. You'll see it on x-ray as erosions and area of lucency. In the distal clavicle, usually these will happen in weightlifters. Uh, coracoid impingement can contribute to compression of the subscapularis tendon as it goes and uh, passes between the coracoid process and the anterior humerus. Usually the distance is uh, 11 millimeters and you measure it at midpoint between the coracoid process and the uh, the humeral head. If it's reduced than uh, 11 uh, millimeters, then you suspect the presence of coracoid or subcoracoid impingement. Okay, this is a, just a quick recap. The acromial type, the slope, the presence of subacromial spur, osacromial can contribute to uh, rotator cuff compression as well as the degenerative changes in the AC joint. Coracoacromial ligament is a thickened, more than three millimeters can also contribute to the compression. Coracohumeral impingement or subcoracoid impingement can contribute, contribute to the subscapularis tendinosis or tear. Right, jumping now to the assessment of the rotator cuff. Now, we finished the assessment of the risk factor for, for uh, impingement. Now we see the causes or the etiologies or the complications, sorry, for impingement. So the uh, supraspinatus originates, as you all know, from the supraspin uh, supraspinatus fossa, 
and infraspinatus from the infraspinatus fossa, both of them converge to insert on the uh, greater tuberosity of the humerus with an area of overlap between the posterior supraspinatus and anterior infraspinatus, or what's known as the conjoint tendon between these two muscles. And you have the third facet of the greater tuberosity of the humerus uh, covered by the teres minor muscle. Again, as an area of orientation, you orient yourself by looking at the coracoid. Coracoid is always one of your landmark to determine if this is an anterior and posterior, right? So the distal aspect of the, of the uh, humerus is like uh, number six in Arabic, right? So you have superior facet, middle facet, and inferior facet. Superior facet is mainly covered by supraspinatus tendon. Middle facet is mainly covered by infraspinatus tendon, and inferior facet is covered by uh, teres minor tendon. The primary plane in which I always assess the uh, the supraspinatus is the uh, coronal image. You look at an area of insertion. This tendon should be dark on all sequences. We see an area of increased signal intensity here because of the magic angle phenomena. My tendinous junction is located also at uh, 12 o'clock position relative to the humeral head. We can sometimes use ancillary imaging planes to localize or assess the rotator cuff tendons, but usually we rely heavily on the coronal and sagittal images. The main ag imaging plane to assess subscapularis is the axial plane, and also we can use the sagittal plane. Infraspinatus can be also assessed on the axial image, but mainly seen or assessed on the coronal image. Okay, the difference between infraspinatus and subscapularis in the coronal image is the presence of the uh, mitindi or, or the shape of the mitendinous junction. So here, this is a single unipinnate muscle, contains one mitendinous junction, which is the infraspinatus, while subscapularis will have approximately three to four uh, uh, mitendinous junctions or slips, or what's known as multipinnate. This is how we can differentiate the, between the, the two and the coronal images. For rotator cuff pathology, we'll discuss tendinopathy, tear, mitendinous uh, retraction, fatty atrophy, and calcific tendinitis. So tendinopathy, as I said earlier, difference between them and the magic angle artifact is that they persist on heavily weighted T2 image, and they can see it on another plane. Like, for example, you can appreciate under the coronal image and on the sagittal image. The difference between tear and tendinosis is the magnitude of increased, uh, uh, of signal increase on a T2 fat sat image. If you see the signal increase similar to that of fluid, then this is uh, tear. If you see it less than that of fluid, then this is tendinosis. For example here, this is a partial thickness tear. Why it's partial thickness? Because it doesn't involve the entirety of the tendon. And it's fluid-like signal intensity, similar to the area of subacromial subdeltoid bursal fluid. This is a partial thickness tear, bursal sided, supraspinatus tear. As you can see it here in the drawing, we have fraying of the upper or bursal aspect with fluid signal intensity filling the gap of the tear. Sometimes we see tears that is concealed within the substance of the tendon. And this is probably will not be readily visible by direct uh, arthroscopy because the, it will be hidden inside 
the tendon or what's known as the remnant tear. Another example of tear that has progressed, a remnant tear that has progressed or traveled uh, across the myotendinous junction with an intramuscular cyst here in the supraspinatus tendon. How did I know that this is supraspinatus? This is the coracoid process. So this is anterior. This is supraspinatus fossa. So this is the supraspinatus muscle. Again, partial thickness tear. This time is articular sided with which has progressed medially or propagated medially to a delaminating intrasubstance tear in the superior uh, aspect of the tendon. Again, sometimes these tears will progress as intramuscular cyst, where if you have a ball valve like mechanism in the tear. So this is a full thickness tear. How did I know it's a tear first? It's a, a gap that is filled with fluid and you can appreciate that this gap is touching the inner part of the deltoid and the articular surface of the humerus. So this is a focal full thickness supraspinatus tear. And you can see here the tendon has retracted medially to the level of the glenohumeral joint line. Again, full thickness tear. It's a gap filled with fluid with mild retraction of the uh, muscle tendinous junction. This is a massive rotator cuff tear. As you notice here, there is gross incongruence of the glenohumeral joint. The concavity of the, of the glenoid should accommodate very nicely the humeral head normally. But here, if you notice that there is incongruence between these two articular surfaces, the humeral head is migrating cranially. And you can see here that there is complete gap of the, of the supraspinatus um, tendon with the retraction even medial to the level of the glenohumeral joint line. Like once we see or we say um, the presence of uh, full thickness tear, automatically we should assess for the presence of fatty atrophy. So if these muscles are not used for quite some time, they will, they will undergo fatty atrophy or fatty degeneration and loss of function. So normally, how to assess it? We look at the sagittal image. What kind of imaging sequence is this? We look at the subcutaneous fat is white, then at an area where we expect to see fluid, the joint cavity is dark. So this is a T1 image. We assess anatomy on this image. So here, the supraspinatus, have a convex upper border. Whenever you see convex upper border, then this is a normal muscle bump. If you see flattening or concavity, then this is reduced muscle bulk or fatty infiltration. As you notice here, it's completely replaced by fat, denoting significant atrophy. Again, from the uh, example that you've seen earlier, the presence of blooming artifacts signifies one of three things, either the presence of metal or the presence of calcification or uh, the presence of hemorrhage. How to differentiate between them? Look at an X-ray. If you see calcification, then you have your diagnosis. If you see calcification within the supraspinatus, that means the patient is having calcific tendonitis or hydroxyapatite deposition disease. Blooming artifacts is seen as an area of dark signal similar to the air outside the patient. Subscapularis attaches to the lesser tuberosity of the humerus. 
and the extraarticular uh, biceps is best also seen on the axial images in the bicipital groove. The, there is the transverse humeral ligament, which is thought as uh, of as continuity of the subscapularis tendon. Avulsion of the subscapularis tendon can be avulsed of the lesser tuberosity. And usually it is associated with this location of the biceps tendon. Normally, the biceps tendon should be in the should be sitting in the groove. But if you have tears of the transverse humeral ligament or the subscapularis, then you will have dislocation of the biceps tendon. Okay. Biceps tendon have uh, two major components, the intraarticular and the extraarticular components. The extraarticular component is basically the one that is contained within the bicipital groove. Then the geno, as it takes a course inside the, the patient's or the, the glenohumeral joint to a transverse component to insert in the supracondylar or supra uh, or the, the uh, biceps ridge of the glenoid bone as it fuses with the superior labrum like this. So tendinosis, how do you see it? You will see it as an increased signal intensity with sometimes thickening, thickening of the tendon. You can appreciate here that this is the vertical component or the extra articular component of long head of bicep tendon. Then this is the geno or the turn. And this is the transverse or the intra articular portion. The intra articular portion should be similar to the extra articular portion in terms of signal intensity and size. You can appreciate two abnormalities regarding the intra articular component. First of all, there is thickening. Second of all, there is intermediate signal intensity denoting moderate to severe tendinosis. Again, the biceps tendon is located in place by the transverse humeral ligament, which is a continuity of the subscapularis tendon. Subluxation can be either intraarticular or extraarticular depending on the integrity of subscapularis tendon. Like in this case here, we have full thickness tear of the subscapularis tendon. How did I know that this is a full thickness subscapularis tear? Basically look at the deltoid, it's touching the bone. It means that there is no subscapularis tissue whatsoever. Another example of medial subluxation, but this time is extra articular because you have an intact component of the subscapularis tendon. How did I know that this is a partial thickness subscapularis tear? Again, the, sub, the deltoid doesn't touch the bone completely, denoting the presence of additional subscapularis fibers. Okay, sometimes you can have interstitial dislocation of the long head of bicep tendon, dislocating in between the tears of the subscapularis. But this is a very uncommon occurrence. Frozen shoulder is very commonly seen in our patient population who are diabetics. The other name for it is adhesive capsulitis. How do you see it? Basically, you look at two structures, the rotator interval and the axillary portion of the long head of biceps uh, of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. On which sequences you look for? On a T2 fat sat image or a stair image? Which planes? The coronal image, usually you can see the axillary pouch of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, which is thickened and edematous. And the rotator interval, we assess it on the sagittal image. Here it's filled with synovitis. Usually when we see these two, this is one of the two commonly described MRI signs for adhesive capsulitis. Lesions of instability, very quickly. This is an anterior dislocation. And as you can see here, there is a health sacs and bony bankert. 
and as you can see, this is uh, an acute dislocation. And the uh, the y y shaped uh, view, you can see the humeral head going anteriorly. Posterior dislocation, we'll see rounded contour of the humeral head with fixed appearance on both internal and external views. If not sure, do either an auxiliary view if the patient tolerate or a transcapular Y view to look for the location of the humeral head. Type lesions of instability, where they live, usually they live in the anterior inferior margin. That is the lesions of instability for the um, uh, anterior dislocation. The normal variants, they will live in the anterior superior quadrant at uh, approximately uh, uh, one o'clock to three o'clock position, the sublabral sulcus and sublabral foramen. And superior labral tear usually at a 12 o'clock position when viewed in the sagittal image. And lesion of instability depending on the degree. Uh, it's either anterior, can, if it was anterior instability with anterior inferior dislocation, or posterior dislocation will give us posterior instability. Right. We'll go through these quickly. So this is an anterior or an axial drawing of the uh, glenoid bone, denoting the presence of a triangular tissue, which is the normal glenoid labrum, which should be firmly attached to the underlying bone. Whenever you see elevation or fluid signal undercutting the base, it means that there is some sort of a tear. If you see high signal, cutting the anterior inferior part of the, of the glenoid, that means this is a tear seen with this location. Depending on the magnitude and degree, we call it as such. Here, for example, you see high signal, fluid like high signal undercutting the base without medialization or osseous defect, signifying the presence of Perthes lesion. So, Perthes lesion will not have any displacement. With Bankert, classical Bankert, you will have completely torn off um, uh, labrum. With Perthes, you'll just have elevation of the perosteum without medialization. And Alpsa or anterior labral perosteal sleeve avulsion, you will have labral tear similar to Perthes, but you have still attached perosteum with medial dislocation of the glenoid. You'll see examples of this. Here, hill sac and the bunker lesion will have dislocation or discontinuity of the anterior inferior labrum with fluid signal intensity undercutting the labrum and disconnecting it from the glenoid and the, uh, and the uh, scapular periosteum. Another classical banker lesion. Labrum is completely detached with detachment of the perosteum as well. Perthes lesion is kind of much more uh, uh, less in terms of magnitude. You will have fluid signal intensity and get undercutting the base of the labrum without medialization. And you have intact anterior uh, scapular perosteum. Again, Perthes lesion, intact perosteum with fluid signal undercutting the base of the labrum. Okay. If you have medialization of the labrum with intact appearance of the perosteum, this will be labeled as ALPSA or anterior labral perosteal sleeve avulsion. The chronic ALPSA sometimes will have resynovialization with deficient appearance of the anterior labrum in comparison to the posterior one.
Another example of ALPSA or anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion. It'll have torn anterior labrum in comparison to the posterior one with medialization and resynovialization with intact periosteal sleeve or intact periosteum. <coughs> Again, another lesion of instability. Here you can see that there is a Hillsax lesion with heterogeneous appearance of the anterior inferior labrum. It's being medialized. Right. The innervations around the shoulder, this is one of the common clinical scenarios that you will see in your clinical practice. The, as we all know, the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles are supplied by the suprascapular nerve that passes from the suprascapular notch and around the neck of the glenoid to supply in the spinoglenoid notch to supply the infraspinatus. So compression of these nerves in this location or in this location will produce atrophy of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus or infraspinatus alone. What are the causes of atrophy? Fibrous bands, ganglion cysts, or masses can cause atrophy of these muscles. So you have, if you have compression of the suprascapular nerve in the spinoglenoid notch alone, you will have isolated infraspinatus muscle atrophy. In this patient here, there is fatty atrophy of the infraspinatus with paralabral cyst compressing the uh, suprascapular nerve. Quadrilateral space syndrome, basically it's compression of the axillary nerve in the quadrilateral space that will give us atrophy of the deltoid and teres minor muscles respectively. What's the causes of compression here? Sometimes fibrous bands, sometimes ganglion cysts can cause axillary uh, nerve compression. As you can see here, the deltoid is fatty replaced with prominent fatty septations in comparison to the adjacent pectoralis, adjacent triceps, adjacent chest wall muscles. Okay, again, atrophy of the teres minor. This is a gradient image. We'll have atrophy of teres minor in addition to atrophy of the deltoid in comparison to the rest of the muscles. Teres minor, atrophic, mild fat infiltration of the deltoid related to quadrilateral uh, space syndrome. If you have involvement or muscle edema of all the, uh, the uh, rotator cuff muscles, then this is uh, considered more of a acute or brachial plexus issues, commonly known as Parsonage Turner syndrome, usually in uh, acute brachial plexitis will give us diffuse form of muscle edema and denervation in the rotator cuff. So this is a summary of the shoulder neuropathies. Parsonage Turner, you will have involvement of all the, the uh, uh, rotator cuff muscles in addition to the deltoid and teres minor. Usually it's a brachial plexus neuritis. Quadrilateral space syndrome, usually it's an axillary nerve compression. We have deltoid and teres minor muscle changes only. Suprascapular notch, if you have uh, super, uh, com mass compressing the suprascapular nerve at this area, you will have atrophy of infraspinatus and supraspinatus. Spinoglenoid notch will give us isolated infraspinatus muscle atrophy. If you have atrophy of infraspinatus, subscapularis, and inf uh, infraspinatus, then think of massive rotator cuff tear. If no tear, then she suspects systemic cause of neuropathy, such as diabetic peripheral neuropathy. But I think this is the end of the shoulder section. As Dr. Noura Inizi, she's asking a question how to differentiate between partial 
and full thickness tear. So we agreed that the, the notion of tear should be said only when we see uh, a defect filled with fluid, okay? If the defect is going through the whole thickness of the tendon or the structure of interest, then this is labeled as full thickness tear. If, it's, if it leaves or, or it fills just a gap and leaves some sort of slips uh, behind, then this is a partial thickness tear. Can we have uh, two to three minutes uh, break uh, before we continue to the uh, knee section? I have another question. What is the normal MRI cuts thickness distance between cuts? Uh, depending, depending on the indication, usually it's uh, uh, for, for uh, MRI, it's three millimeters. Distance or interslice gap, usually there is none. Uh, for CT scan, it's usually 0.6 uh, millimeters. Hi, uh, we'll continue our uh, presentation with uh, the knee. Um, basically, we'll jump straight uh, forward to, to MRI. So uh, again, uh, the, uh, the knee follows this, uh, the, the main axis of the body, like the sagittal, you're called sagittal, not sagittal oblique, coronal. The uh, coronal images, again, the same to, to the main axis of the body and the axial images as well. Uh, sometimes we do specialized... Uh, uh, we have interruptions. Dr. Yosef Hamamali, Dr. Yosef, your phone, uh, please close the speaker. Close the mic. Thank you very much. Right. 
sometimes we do dedicated imaging planes for uh, specific structures. Like for example, in this image, it's not a, a, a direct coronal, but coronal for uh, the anterior cruciate ligament. Sometimes also we do a direct axial. This will help us to localize or visualize the anterior cruciate ligament to a better extent. But usually in my experience, it's not really needed. And we'll just consume your MRI magnet uh, time. Uh, sequences, again, uh, we do a T1 image, stair images, or T2 fat set images. Uh, we don't need the gradient that much here until unless you are suspecting PVNS. Of course, if you are suspecting tumor, uh, arthritis, or infection, you need the post-contrast uh, images. Knee arthrogram usually it's reserved to 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 post arthrogram or post meniscal repair patients. Again, MRI technique, we have the open magnets. Usually uh, they claim or the selling point for them is that it's a, a claustrophobic patient friendly. But in my experience, if the patient is truly claustrophobic, even uh, an open MRI magnet will be a very uh, difficult experience for him. And this is the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, MRI dedicated knee coil that we use for uh, knee imaging. Uh, nowadays, uh, with the advancements of, uh, of knee imaging or MRI technology, we're beginning to see fast uh, MRI sequences in which you have a whole MRI knee done in uh, five minutes. And of course, in, in private hospitals and private imaging centers, time equals money in terms of MRI. The shorter that you can do the, your study, the more patients that you can do and the more revenue you can generate for your institution. Uh, the uh, basic approach, we'll see the, we'll go through the, uh, the, uh, these steps. Usually uh, each, uh, each uh, plane will have a dedicated or uh, best use. Like for example, the joint effusion, usually I like to to look at it on the uh, sagittal images, but you can also see it on the axial images as well. Uh, bone alignment is best carried out by the sagittal images. Anterior cruciate ligament, I like to look at it or assess it on the sagittal image. And I use the other imaging planes like the axial and coronal images as an ancillary sequences or ancillary imaging planes. Posterior cruciate ligament is best assessed on the sagittal image. Um, the uh, medial and lateral collateral ligaments are best assessed on the coronal images, the quadriceps and patellar tendons. Logically, you assess it when you look for joint diffusion. So assess it on sagittal image. Patellar cartilage, usually we assess it on an axial image. And the menisci, usually I don't assess it on a single plane. I use different different planes to localize my findings. Usually a combination of a sagittal and a coronal image type. Um, this is probably geared towards uh, radiology uh, residents. Uh, whenever we see an image, the, one of the most important thing is to localize where are you in terms of what, where is the medial side and where is the lateral side. <laughs> Here, we follow consistently present structures. Like for example, if you see the fibula, the fibula is always lateral. So this is the lateral part of the knee and this is the medial part of the knee. If you don't see the fibula, then we look at a consistently present structure like the fibula. Like in this case here, we see this low signal intensity line signifying the presence of iliotibial band. Iliotibial band is always lateral. So this is the lateral part of the image. So lateral femoral condyle and lateral tibial plateau. On the axial image, like so, if we see the fibula, the fibula is always lateral. If you don't see the fibula, then you're probably at the level of the femoral trochlea or patella. So the long facet of the patella is also lateral. 
on the sagittal images, how do you orient yourself? If you see the fibula, then the fibula is always lateral. If you don't see the fibula, then you look at the shape of the proximal tibial plateau. If it's shaped like a club, then this is uh, the lateral part. If it's uh, shaped like a teacup, uh, then this is the medial part. What do we mean by club and tea, teacup? This is taken from the golf uh, sport. The club is usually having asymmetrical morphology in which you have an elongated posterior process and downstoping anterior part. The teacup is in which you have like an equal portions of the anterior and posterior components. Okay. How to look for joint diffusion? Again, sagittal image, look at the suprapatellar pouch. You'll see the swelling here. Usually, you see it without a fluid fluid level. If you see it with fluid fluid level, as in this case here, then always suspect the presence of intraarticular fracture. Again, joint diffusion. What kind of sequence is this? Fat sat, T2, fat sat, Y. Subcutaneous fat is dark, areas of fluid are white, so this is a T2 fat sat image. You have here significant knee joint effusion. Bones and muscles, usually the uh, yellow marrow follow the subcutaneous fat signal intensity on all sequences. Red marrow, on the other hand, because of the cellularity, uh, it follows it kind of follows the, the fluid signal intensity on T2, but it's not as bright on T2 fat sat. And on T1 weighted images, it is of intermediate signal intensity. Right. There are a couple of patterns of bone marrow edema that happens around the knee signifies the presence of a specific injury. Like, for example, if you have a pivot shift mechanism of injury, okay, it means the patient twisted with a planted foot to the floor. This will do uh, perform an internal rotation uh, maneuver to bring the posterior part of the lateral tibial plateau to the anterior part of the lateral femoral condyle with an impaction fracture. The presence of bone marrow edema here and bone marrow edema here, it means that at one point during the injury, this part was landing very hard on this part, namely pivot shift me mechanism. Why it's important to know this kind of pattern of bone marrow edema? Because they are associated with specific uh, soft tissue injuries. Like for example, if I see this immediately, I will look at the ACR. And I know that this is a secondary sign for ACL tear. Another example of specific bone marrow edema is the clip pattern in which the patient receives a blow to the outer part of the knee, resulting in bone marrow contusion here. And it will have an increased uh, varus stress to the medial collateral ligament to, produ to produce uh, medial collateral ligament tear. The dashboard kind of injury, you will see bone marrow edema to the anterior part of the of the tibia. Okay, this is usually associated with uh, posterior cruciate ligament uh, tear. The uh, hyperextension pattern of injury. It's usually uh, uh, located in the anterior femur and anterior tibia. The notoriously known uh, uh, transient patellar dislocation pattern, usually the patella always uh, dislocates laterally. So sometimes you will see a bone marrow edema pattern at the area of contact during injury. Like for example here, bone marrow edema in the medial part of the patella and the lateral femoral condyle. So this pattern is, is known as transient patellar dislocation pattern.
Let's check on the regions. Type. Cartilage, usually it's trilaminar appearance. Degenerative defects usually have sloping margins. Traumatic defects have sharply marginated uh, borders. ACL, usually it's comprom uh, comprised of two bundles, the anteromedial and posterolateral bundles, and inserts on the interspinous fossa and the medial tibial spine. How does it look on MRI? So the anteromedial bundle is always, always seen as low signal intensity line, dark line across all sequences. This is the anteromedial bundle and the inserts on the medial tibial spine. Then the posterolateral bundle, it's normally frayed, like uh, multiple parallel lines. This will insert in the interspinous fossa. Here, do we see a normal ACL? We don't see normal ACL. In the chronic phase, usually it's not uh, accompanied by any effusion. As you see here, you don't see that normal low signal intensity structure that you'd expect to see a fibrous tissue. Like, for example, the normal ACL should be dark like this. Here, no ACL is seen. What kind of sequence in this is this one? Subcutaneous fat is dark. It is a fluid or white. And this is a T2 fat sat. We look for uh, edema and pathology in this. Here, we'd expect to see normal ACL with striated appearance of the posterolateral bundle. And you can see here or just uh, jumbled mess in the interspinous or intercondylar fossa signifying the presence of full thickness ACL tear. The primary signs of ACL tear is usually fiber discontinuity. Basically, you don't see the normal tendon. Changing course in terms of, uh, like for example, more horizontal orientation, empty notch, the area where you would expect to see normal ACL is filled with fluid. Secondary signs, as we just uh, said earlier, pivot shift pattern of bomber edema, anterior tibial translation more than seven millimeters, mimicking the clinical sign of anterior uh, drawer test. And the presence of second fracture is almost always uh, accompanied by uh, ACL tear. How to look for second fracture? Basically in the lateral aspect of the tibial plateau, look for a small chip of fracture. This signifies the presence of uh, a vulgin injury at the capsular insertion of the tendon. Usually always accompanied by full thickness ACL tear. The anterior tibial translation is more than uh, seven millimeters. How to do it? Uh, on the sagittal image, you draw a line from the posterior uh, part of the lateral femoral condyle down to the ground and the line from the uh, lateral tibial plateau down to the ground. And the distance between them should be less than seven millimeters. If more than that, yeah, more than nine millimeters, then I will call this as a passive anterior tibial translation positive, indicating either laxity or ligamentous injury. Empty notch sign, normally the ACL should be living here as a low signal or dark structure. And as you can see here, it's filled with fluid signifying the presence of full thickness tear. Again, an ex another example of full thickness tear. You'd expect normally to see the, the ACL here. It's not present, only minimal fibers signifying the presence of partial thickness tear. Still, you can appreciate some fibers across the anterior medial bundle. Um, and, and sometimes we see this kind of pattern in patients with uh, who are uh, old age. You see uh, mycoid degeneration of the anterior cruciate ligament, in which you see diffuse thickening and edema of the tendon with preservation of the individual fibers giving you 
the celery stalk appearance of the anterior cruciate ligament. Posterior cruciate ligament, again, normal tendon is usually dark in all sequences. Here, this is the normal ACL. See the anteromedial bundle and posterolateral bundle. Posterior cruciate ligament here is torn in the middle with focal discontinuity and fluid filling the gap. Five. What if you see two PCLs, like another a PCL and another one here below it? Then what does it mean? Usually we have a single PCL and there is no variance that I know of that will be a double PCL. Okay, usually if we see two PCLs in the same sagittal image, it means that the you have a displaced meniscal fragment in the intercondylar notch. Usually a bucket handle tear of the either the medial or the lateral meniscus. As you notice here, this is the meniscus. This is a 3D representation of the of the pathology. The meniscal tissue has torn in the middle and the displaced fragment still connects to the main body of the meniscus with displacement in the intercondylar notch. Medial collateral ligament, usually graded in threes, either edema on both sides, that this is grade one injury. Uh, grade two injury is usually uh, thickening of the tendon and grade three is complete discontinuity. So one, in, uh, one very important thing to, to, to pay attention to, and I've seen lots of misses regarding it, the medial collateral ligament attaches approximately five centimeters below the uh, joint line. So sometimes you'll have like inexperienced technologists or MRI scanners that actually cut the joint at this area. If you image the joint at this area, okay, then you will miss distal tears. Like in this case here. If you have only image, imaging to this area and you don't include the distal insertion of the medial collateral ligament, you will miss some significant pathology. Sometimes it reaches up to grade three uh, tendon tear. Lateral collateral ligament, what are the components usually? Uh, the biceps, uh, the iditable band, the biceps femoris, and the lateral collateral ligament proper. Grade one injury is usually edema on both sides. Grade three is, is uh, a complete discontinuity, and grade two is thickening of the tendon itself with intermediate or with edema. Uh, sometimes we see patients with lateral. Uh, uh, lateral uh, uh, knee pain, in which you see areas of fluid between the iliotibial band and the lateral femoral condyle. And you, when you look on the axial images, you don't see continuity of this bag of fluid with the suprapatellar pouch, signifying the presence of extra articular fluid. Whenever you see fluid interposed between the iliotibial band and the, uh, the uh, lateral femoral condyle, then this is uh, Aletival band friction syndrome, or what's known as runner's knee. So I have another, uh, we'll answer a few questions regarding uh, before we jump into the uh, minisky. So can we have the slides when you finish up? Sure, inshallah. Uh, can I be, how can I be sure I'm looking at MCL, not uh, LCL? The medial collateral ligament, usually, it is a uh, curvilinear structure and it's closely applies to the, uh, to the uh, 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 joint capsule. Uh, again, uh, in the coronal image, how do you know lateral from medial? If you don't see the fibula, then you look at this structure, the ADT bell band. ADT bell band is always lateral. And this is the area where you look for the lateral collateral ligament, and this is the area where you look for the medial collateral ligament.
Any further questions? طيب مشكلة ناتومي طيب uh, from this 3D image you can notice that the meniscus is a fibrocartilage تمام fibrocartilage معناته ايش؟ معناته there is no signal that should come from it unless you have degeneration or persistent peripheral vascularity if the patient is young or tear okay but normally the meniscus should be dark on all sequences because it is a fibrocartilage while high line cartilage that lines the surfaces of the bone is full of uh, fluid normally and should be uh, behaving like a fluid signal. It should reflect back some signal on fluid sensitive fat suppressed images. Type. From this 3D image, you can notice that the medial meniscus is larger, lateral meniscus is smaller. Type. Anterior horn of the medial meniscus is larger than the posterior horn. And the lateral meniscus, the anterior horn, is equal in size to the posterior horn. Why this morphological uh, description is important? You don't want to miss a displaced fragment. You can miss a displaced fragment if you have alteration in morphology and you didn't pick it up. Again, this is more of a gross uh, anatomical picture of the medial meniscus and lateral meniscus. It's a wedge shape when you cut it in cross section of the semilunar uh, hyaline cartilage or fibrocartilage. The superior surface can be concave and the inferior surface is usually flat. Fibrocartilage is usually dark on all sequences unless you have either persistent peripheral vascularity Degeneration or tear. Okay. Like, uh, recently it has been described that the menisci have a zonal anatomy in terms of uh, vascularity. You have the white zone, the white red zone, or the red zone. So there is no clear anatomical boundary that we can see by imaging to differentiate between these three sites, okay? But generally speaking, we divide them in these three thirds. And the description is usually to give us an idea about the vascularity of the portion of the injured meniscus. Like the outer part is usually called the red zone. And this is because it's heavily supplied by uh, vascularity. And as you all know, uh, vascular supply indicates or facilitates healing. If you have tear of the white zone, then the chances of healing is much less. So this is the red-white zone, peripheral zone, the red zone, and the meniscal calves junction. And this is the central zone or the white zone. The most uh, inner part of the uh, free uh, of the white zone is the free edge, in which you see truncation and degenerative appearance there. Again, the meniscus anatomy, the peripheral part, is usually the one that is heavily supplied with vascular supply, usually from the genicular uh, vessels. The extent usually is limited to the 30% uh, to 25% of the width, uh, more on the medial meniscus. Why this is important? Because sometimes outer, outer uh, meniscal tear uh, will, will uh, be a good candidate for uh, spontaneous healing. As you all see here, there is no clear anatomical boundaries between these 
two uh, two two zones or three zones. Usually, it's arbitrarily uh, classified, and you will see these uh, involved uh, in in. Uh, uh, if the tear is involved in the outer aspect, vascular aspect, usually uh, three to five millimeters from the capsule, uh, patient can either undergo surgical repair or conservative therapy. Usually conservative therapy works with these patients because of the vascular supply that fa facilitates healing. If the tear is involving the non-vascular portion or the inner one-third, then this is usually a poor candidate for spontaneous healing, and the patient probably might be a candidate for partial or total meniscectomy if it's causing mechanical problems. But medial meniscus, usually the size of the anterior horn is smaller than the posterior horn. If you have an anterior horn that is larger than the posterior horn means that you have a flipped fragment somewhere. The lateral meniscus, on the other hand, you have an equal size of the anterior horn and posterior horn. Attachments, meniscus should be uh, maintained in normal position by the attachment of the meniscal roots. We have capsular attachment outside and central attachment to the tibial plateau. Medial meniscus attachment, the anterior attachment, anterior horn attachment can be attached to the trans, through the transverse ligament to the other meniscus or the anterior root. The body, through the capsular attachment, through various meniscal capsular ligaments. Posterior horn is uh, through the posterior root of the uh, meniscus or posterior root ligament. Lateral meniscus, on the other hand, attachment. The anterior horn also attaches through the transverse ligament, transverse meniscal ligament to the contralateral side, and an anterior root attachment as well. The capsule, the body attaches through the capsular ligaments to the superior and inferior fasciculus and to the iliotibial band. Does not usually attaches to the lateral collateral ligament. Posterior horn attaches to the meniscal femoral ligament to the uh, to the femur through the the Humphrey and Risberg ligaments and popliteal meniscal ligaments through the uh, superior and inferior fasciculus with also posterior root attachment. Bye. One of the commonest meniscal variant that you will see also in your clinical practice is the discoid lateral meniscus. How to look at, uh, what's the commonly involved uh, meniscus is the lateral meniscus. How to see it? Basically, on the coronal image here, if we see the meniscus reaching to the intercondylar notch, then this is discoid meniscus. If you see the anterior horn and posterior horns of the lateral meniscus connected to each other on more than three images, then this is discoid meniscus. What's the commonest symptoms of uh, discoid meniscus? Is usually commonly is clicking. Patella. So the patella have three facets, usually the lateral facet, the median ridge, medial facet and the third facet, which is called the odd facet. Usually the odd facet is not covered by articular cartilage. The patellar variants that you should know, two things, bipartite patella and the dorsal defect of the patella, because these can be mistaken for pathology. Bipartite patella, for example, can be mistaken for patellar fracture and dorsal defect of the patella can be mistaken for two things, either a lytic lesion or uh, osteochondritis discans of the patella type. Bipartite patella usually lives in the upper outer part of the patella, right? And the interfaces between the bone fragment and the host bone are usually sclerotic. And you can fit them to each other. 
is painful or there's bone marrow edema on MRI, then you probably think of an unstable synchondrosis, but usually it does not mean fractures if it's asymptomatic. So compare it to patellar fracture. Usually patellar fractures are transversely oriented or depends on the magnitude and degree of trauma. But usually it's a more of a distraction type of uh, mechanism of injury in which it produces transverse patellar fracture. Dorsal defect of the patella, how do you see it? You see it on X-ray as a rounded lucency in the, in the patellar body with area of surrounding sclerosis type. How to know it on MRI? You basically see the defect, but you interestingly see that the unlike uh, osteochondral lesion, the patellar cartilage is continuous and covering the whole defect. And for example, here, and this is a CTR program, you can see the intra-articular contrast outlining the, the uh, dorsal defect of the patella with an intact appearance of the overlying uh, cartilage. Chondromalacia patella, usually the word chondromalacia, uh, it's derived from uh, arthroscopic literature, means bone uh, or uh, cartilage softening. You can see that by MRI, by uh, noticing the increased signal intensity in the first stage, then you have variable degree of thinning until you have complete bone loss to a grade four chondromalacia patella. Patellar tendon, again, as with any tendon in the body, normally it is of low signal intensity or dark signal intensity on all sequences. It is one of the tendons that at, uh, are at risk at risk for uh, magic angle artifacts because of its orientation to the main axis of the of the body uh, or the MRI magnet to five, 55 degrees. Uh, if you're not about, aware about this, you will overcall patellar tendinosis. And by this, we finish the. Uh, MRI knee talk. I will answer a few questions here. Type for ligamental injury, what time MRI should be done after injury? Type um, from practical standpoint, it doesn't matter which which time you you perform the the uh, the uh, imaging. Usually, the sooner the better. To 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 give us an idea of the magnitude of the of the injury, tamam. So uh, if you have edema, then uh, edema equals pathologist, right? But but from a practical perspective, usually the access for uh, for uh, MRI is difficult in most of the major institutions. Usually, these patients will give, be given an appointment after uh, two to three months. Uh, at that time, the edema have resolved, and the true, true pathology and true uh, uh, injuries have uh, probably resolved. Um, by, uh, in the T, we comminuted fracture of the condyles. Is MRI suggested to rule out uh, ligamentous injuries? which can't uh, be assessed clinically? Yes, you can. Uh, how to avoid mixing between uh, ACL and PCL on MRI? So basically, the uh, anterior cruciate ligament originates where? There is a visual mnemonic. I don't know if you ca caught it uh, earlier in the talk. Uh, yes, that's it. Like, cross your fingers in front of your knee, and the middle finger will be considered the anterior cruciate ligament, right? So the anterior cruciate ligament originates from the lateral, uh, the inner part, the medial part of the lateral femoral condyle to insert in the medial tibial spine, right? And you see that on imaging, okay? And posterior cruciate ligament is the vice versa, right? 
the lateral part of the uh, medial femoral condyle to the posterior part of the tibia. Usually, posterior cruciate ligament have a very distinct appearance. How does it look like? It looks like a cord, basically. Let's see if we have an image for posterior cruciate ligament here. See? So, rounded, like a cable, okay? Coursing in the posterior part. Like a... They can sit in Arabic. Okay? Anterior cruciate ligament, on the other hand, because composed of two bundles, in uh, two identifiable bundles on imaging. Posterior cruciate ligament is also composed of two bundles, but you cannot distinctly differentiate between the two on MRI. While anterior cruciate ligament, you can actually differentiate between the anterior, anteromedial and posterolateral bundles. Like in this case here, for example, this is the anteromedial bundle, which is a dark line, and posterolateral bundle, which is uh, striated appearance. I uh, think we are finished with the uh, uh, MRI knee talk now. We'll begin the ankle shortly, inshallah. We'll have like two two minute breaks. Huh?
طيب uh, let's continue now with the ankle. طيب MRI anatomy, the, the next talks are going to be much faster than the previous ones. I think I put the greater details in the previous ones more than the, the rest. So because it is much more common to see it in clinical practice rather than the, the others. Huh? Type for uh, MRI anatomy of the ankle. Uh, again, the sequences, uh, you're going to need a T1, a stair, and probably a gradient as well. The imaging planes, you can use the axial, the sagittal, and the coronal images to assess different structures. Usually the axial images, we uh, use it to assess the, the tendons, the flexor, extensor, peroneal tendons, and the Achilles tendon. So here, how to know that I am medial or lateral? Look at the fibula. If the fibula is always lateral. Then if we establish that this is lateral, then the tendons that are behind the, the fibula are the peroneal tendon. Peroneus brevis is usually anterior. Peroneus longus is usually posterior. Then the tendon in the, in the middle is the tendo Achilles or uh, Achilles tendon. And medial to it, you have the plantaris tendon, which is a dark dot here. Then we have the three tendons here, anterior and three uh, flexor tendons here, posterior. Tibialis posterior tendon is usually, or it is the one that is most medial. Then the flexor digitorum longus is the one next to it. Then you have the neurovascular bundle, and then the flexor halicis longus. There's a common mnemonic for that uh, helps you in memorizing the positions. So Tom, Dick, and Harry. Tibialis posterior, Dick is uh, flexor digitorum longus, and Harry is the flexor halicis longus. And then you switch these in the extensor compartment. Okay, you have tibialis anterior, extensor halicis longus, and extensor digitorum longus. Okay, again, with the tendons, tendons are dark on all sequences. You shouldn't have any increased signal intensity here. If you have increased signal intensity, it can be one of two things, either magic angular artifact or tendinosis. Again, something specific for the tendons because you, you have a tendon sheath. If you have fluid surrounding the tendon, then probably you are dealing with tenosynovitis of various causes. Here on the axial images, again, you can see tibialis anterior, extensor digitorum, uh, longus and extensor halicis longus, then the tibialis anterior neurovascular bundle, posteriorly tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, and flexor halicis longus here, then we have Achilles tendon posteriorly. Right. Uh, one important notice that you should pay attention to here on the axial images, it's one of the sequences that we use to assess the collateral ligaments of the ankle. If you have the fibula to be shaped like the letter D, okay, then this is the level that you assess the anterior uh, and posterior inferior tibiofibular ligaments. Usually it has an oblique course, okay, from uh, inferior to superior. And you shouldn't interpret uh, focal defects on a single axial image. You follow the tendon up and down. While the uh, anterior talofibular and posterior talofibular, you can see it on a single image. How do you know that you are at the level of the talofibular ligament? You look at the shape of the fibula. If the fibula is comma-shaped, in comparison to D-shaped, then you are at the level of the talofibular ligament. Again, with each ligament in the body, it should be normally low signal intensity or dark on all sequences. Why? Because it contains, or it's mainly composed of fibrous material. And fibrous material 
will have tightly bound hydrogen atoms, and hydrogen atoms that are tightly bound does not produce any signal to the MRI machine. Okay. The primary imaging plane that I assess the lateral collateral ligaments in is the axial images. How to know the various levels of the lateral collateral ligaments? You assess the shape and morphology of the distal fibula. If the distal fibula is shaped like the letter D, then you are at the level of the inferior tibiofibular ligaments, the anterior and posterior ones. If it's comma shaped, then you are at the level of the talofibular ligaments, the anterior and posterior. The calcanofibular ligaments is usually much lower than this, and it's uh, interposed between the uh, the uh, peroneal tendons and the calcaneus. You see it as a dark line on all sequences as well. Okay, hope this is clear so far. The coronal image, what is it used for? I use it primarily to look for the the uh, the Taylor cartilage, and I, I use it also to look to assess the medial collateral ligament, the deltoid, the superficial and deeper components, as well as the patel uh, or uh, Taylor cartilage. Right. I do, uh, usually I go in a systemic, uh, systematic fashion uh, to assess the uh, ankle tendon and ligaments. Uh, starting from posterior, there is the Achilles tendon. Achilles tendon, again, it is composed of fibrous material, and fibrous material does not return any signal on MRI. So uh, the Achilles tendon is dark on all sequences. Usually, the size is less than 6 millimeters when you see it in short axis or in terms of thickness type. The other thing is that the Achilles tendon does not have tendon sheath. So sometimes you can see edema and inflammation around it, and that's called peritendinitis rather than tenosynovitis. Why it's not tenosynovitis? Because there is no accompanying uh, tendon sheath of the Achilles tendon. It's the largest tendon in the body formed by conjoined tendon from the gastrocnemius and soleus muscle and inserted in the posterior calcaneus, contributes to the plantar flexion. <coughs> but the fat pad anterior to it is called Kager's fat pad. It's usually uh, similar to the subcutaneous fat as well. You shouldn't see any edema in it. The Achilles tendon is, is usually less, less than six millimeters in thickness. If you have enlargement, then you are probably dealing with degenerative appearance of the uh, Achilles tendon. Tendinosis and tear. Again, you will see it as focal fluid gap on the images, axial or sagittal images. If it's complete, you will see the fluid signal intensity replacing the complete axis or the complete thickness of the tendon. If you see still residual some fibers, then this is a partial thickness tear. With tendon degeneration, we'll see it as diffuse swelling more than six millimeters. <coughs> tendon tear. Again, if you see fluid in a gap, that equals tear, as in this case. The tendon should be continuing down to insert on the posterior calcaneus. Here, we don't see any tendon at all. Instead, if this is replaced by a fluid-filled gap, then this is a full thickness uh, AC, uh, uh, Achilles tendon tear. Sometimes we follow these patients up and the tear, if it's interstitial, it's replaced by fibrous material and it will be reverting back to its normal low signal intensity. But the thickness is going to be the same and probably thicker because of the reparative process. The Achilles tendon does not have a tendon sheath, but it has some uh, surrounding bursae. 
you have the pre Achilles or retrocarcania bursa, and you have the retro Achilles bursa. So, pre Achilles bursa is a bursal uh, structure that is located between the Achilles tendon and the posterior calcaneus. Uh, some patients can have pre Achilles or, or retrocalcaneal bursitis. So, what's the significance of that? What are the causes of retrocalcaneal bursitis? Can be mechanical or can be related to underlying inflammatory arthritis. Okay. Such as what? Such as rheumatoid arthritis and writer's disease. Okay. Can produce retro. Uh, Achilles bursitis, sorry, uh, retrocalcaneal bursitis. While retrocalcaneal bursitis, retroachilles bursitis, i.e. bursitis posterior to the Achilles tendon is purely mechanical, usually because of uh, tight-fitting shoes. Sometimes you will have bony, sp bony spurring here in the posterior calcaneus, as you can see in Haglund's syndrome, causing the retrocalcaneal Bursitis, as in this case here, prominent posterior process of the calcaneus with retrocalcaneal bursitis. This was, I think, uh, as a rheumatoid arthritis patient, but uh, Hagelin syndrome can also look like this with a much more prominent and pointy appearance of the posterior surface of the calcaneus. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, Achilles tendon does not have a tendon sheath. So if you have uh, edema or inflammation surrounding it, usually seen in, uh, or uh, it's called peritendinitis rather than tenosynovitis. Kegel's fat pad can also be affected in various disease processes such as rheumatoid arthritis in which you will have in which you will have uh, edematous changes. The lateral collateral ligament, I just discussed it in terms of uh, how to identify them. Uh, again, quick recap, you localize which, where is your lateral part, how to localize it, how to localize that by looking at the fibula. If the fibula is le uh, like the letter D, then you are at the level of the inferior tibiofibular ligament. If it's comma-shaped, then you are at the level of the calcaneofibular ligaments. Peroneal tendons, usually located posterior to the distal fibula with the peroneus brevis and uh, located anteriorly and the longest located posteriorly. Usually the brevis inserts in the base of the fifth metatarsal bone and the longest crosses from the underneath the foot to insert in the base of the first metatarsal bone. Uh, sometimes patients will have uh, tibialis or uh, peroneal uh, tendon, peroneus brevis tendon tear, usually in, a, in company with lateral collateral ligament injuries in which you will see a V-shaped appearance of the of the uh, uh, peroneus brevis tendon, like in this case here. This is the tendon of the peroneus lingus, uh, uh, longus, and this is the two slips of the peroneus brevis split into two, uh, two uh, structures. Again, V-shaped or long tendon split tear of peroneus brevis tendon. In complete ruptures, you will see complete absence of the tendon with proximal retraction. As you can see here in this case, there is only a single tendon and the other one is touching the bone immediately with proximal retraction on the sagittal images. Yeah, we'll discuss quickly the uh, uh, lateral ankle injuries. Uh, 
the lateral ankle ligament injuries. Usually, as I said, with the medial collateral ligament of the knee, we have the grading system of three. Grade one is usually just the edema surrounding the structure of interest. Grade two is mild thickening with intermediate signal intensity, signifying interstitial tear. And grade three is complete discontinuity of the tendon. Of course, you will see it by radiographs, but we'll not uh, touch these for now. The anterior talofibular ligament is the commonly torn ligament. You will see fluid in the subcutaneous soft tissues. And as I told you uh, uh, previously, we identify the anterior talofibular ligament by the shape of the fibula. Comma shaped, then this is the level of the anterior talofibular ligament. Ligaments usually are low signal intensity fibrous structures because of the uh, fibrous material. Whenever you see that replaced by fluid, it means that there is tear. So here, you should normally see a dark line connecting the talus to the anterior part of the uh, distal fibula. Here, there is a focal discontinuity with complete replacement of the tendon signifying full thickness anterior talofibular ligament tear. Another example, comma shaped, absent uh, normal low signal intensity line here, completely replaced by a bag of fluid. That's uh, due to anterior talofibular ligament tear. Sometimes this can be accompanied by a vulgin of the tailor attachment, but most of the time is a mid substance tear. In the chronic stage, you can see uh, uh, tendon elongation and tendon or ligament fibrosis of the anterior talofibular ligament. How does it look like? Usually, the normal ligament is uh, three to four uh, millimeters in thickness. If you see it more than that, with the convex borders, as in this case here, then this is uh, chronic tear with fibrosis of the uh, ligament. How did I know that this is the talofibular ligament level? Again, the shape of the fibula. If it's comma shaped, then this is the uh, talofibular ligament lig level. The syndesmotic ligament and the inferior tibiofibular ligaments level is usually when the fibula is shaped like the letter D. Okay. The normal ligaments are low signal intensity structures on all sequences. If it's thickened or convex margins, then you think of uh, ligament tear. If it's low signal intensity without any edema, and that's a chronic phase. If it's uh, replaced by fluid, then this is usually an acute phase. But keep in mind that the inferior tibiofibular ligament has an oblique course. See, as you can see here on the 3D image, it's going from down to up. So if you cut it here on the axial image, you will see part of it and the other part is filled with fluid. So don't overcall this as a tear because if you follow the tendon or the ligament up and down, you can establish the oblique course and the continuity of the ligament. The posterior is there rarely injured, but can be seen with significant uh, uh, significant uh, injuries. Again, complete tear of the anterior talofibular ligament, comma shaped. The normal fibrous structure is lost and replaced by a, a, a fluid filled gap. Anterior, you have tibialis anterior, extensor hallucis longus, and extensor digitorum longus. We don't have any specific ligaments there. And usually the, the pathology is much less clinically encountered than the posterior uh, compartment tendons. Like in this example here, tibialis anterior tear with proximal retraction. Whenever you see a full thickness tear of any tendon, particularly around the, the ankle, always ask for a sagittal extended field of view because sometimes these tendons 
can retract up to the level of mid leg. And that is usually not covered in, in routine ankle MRIs. Medial aspect, we have the deltoid ligament. We don't have any specific tendons. Uh, again, in terms of, of uh, the posterior tendon assessment, we have the, uh, the tibialis posterior tendon. Uh, the injuries or pathology of the tibialis posterior tendon is the commonest cause of acquired uh, flat foot deformity. Okay, well, the, the grading, again, three grades. We have a partial tear. We have partial tear with attenuation uh, tendon and uh, grade three is complete tear with a fluid filled gap. The type one injury here, we have tendinosis with linear interstitial increase in signal intensity of the tibialis posterior tendon. Complete rupture will be replaced by uh, a bag of fluid or a gap filled with fluid. Now here, this is the tibialis posterior and this is the flexor digitorum and this is the flexor hallucis longus tendon. What's so special about the flexor hallucis longus tendon? It is one of the tendons with a tendon sheath that communicates with the ankle joint cavity. So whatever fluid you have, in the ankle, you will have part of it also uh, uh, going into the flexor hallucis longus tendon sheath. What other ligaments or uh, tendons in the body that exhibits this, this behavior? We have the iliopsoas tendon. In 15% of patients, they communicate with the hip joint cavity, and you have the long head of passive tendon sheath communicate with the glenohumeral joint cavity as well. So how to differentiate between tenosynovitis of the FHL and normal fluid? You look at the amount of uh, joint fusion. If you have joint fluid with a similar amount of fluid in the flexor hallucis longus tendon sheath, then this is uh, probably physiological. If the amount in the, of, of the fluid is more in the uh, flexor hallucis longus tendon sheath, then you think of Pathological tenosynovitis. Again, tibialis posterior tenosynovitis and uh, peroneal tenosynovitis. How to know tenosynovitis? You see the tendon sheath filled with fluid. The only exception of this nomenclature in the ankle is the Achilles tendon. Why? Because it doesn't have a tendon sheath. So if you see edema surrounding the Achilles tendon, we call it as peritendinitis rather than tenosynovitis. Deltoid ligament usually best assessed on the coronal images. You have a deep component and you have a superficial component. And much like the posterolateral bundle of the anterior cruciate ligament, the deep component of the deltoid ligament is normally striated with areas of uh, fluid-like signal intensity in between these striations, but you know you don't have any irregular fluid filled gap. Deltoid sprain will have just smearing uh, with with the intermediate signal intensity, as in this case here. We don't appreciate the normal striations, signifying a deltoid ligament sprain. A tear uh, will be apparent if you see a transversely oriented irregular signal of the deltoid ligament. Complete tear, you will see complete absence and replacement with a, uh, a defect with fluid. Plantar fasciitis, commonly encountered clinically. Do you need imaging for it? Usually the, the, the uh, history is uh, pretty much uh, uh, revealing. 
pain on on in walking limited and and uh, uh, pinpointed to the calcaneus how do you see it you see it uh, how we diagnose uh, plantar fasciitis based on the presence of calcaneal spur with surrounding edema you see edema superficial and edema deep to the tendon this is the uh, the mild stages then the the later stages you will see thickening and edema of the plantar fascia itself uh, and as it, uh, the disease progress you will see focal tear with fluid filled gap as in this case here you have severe thickening of the middle cord of the plantar fascia with intermediate signal intensity and some areas of fluid filled gaps indicating severe tendinosis with partial thickness tear quick word about osteochondral lesions usually uh, can be in the uh, medial or uh, lateral tailor dome uh, what do you want to know you want to know if it's stable or not how to know its stability you basically look at the base of the uh, attachment with the host bone if the base of with the host bone is filled with fluid that means this is potentially unstable if the tendon or the bone fragment is completely dislodged or dislocated from its location then this is clearly unstable i hope uh, everything is clear i don't see any questions regarding the ankle take uh, one minute or so two minute uh, break and uh, we'll continue with the rest of the lecture. I think we have uh, 30 minutes left. We'll finish with the last two parts, the MRI of the elbow joint and uh, MRI of the spine. So again, with the imaging planes, uh, yeah, MRI of the elbow uh, does not have any specific uh, imaging plane nomenclature. Uh, it follows the main axis of the body the sagittal, coronal, and axial images. So what to look for for the bones, ligaments, tendons, nerves, and muscles, and other soft tissues, lesions. In terms of localization, radius is always lateral, uh, and ulna is medial as well, logically speaking. A tendon attachment, you have a very complex tendon attachment surrounding the, the elbow with the common extensor tendon, and extensor carpi ulnaris longus in attaching in the supracondylar ridge. Then we have the lateral collateral ligament and lateral ulnar collateral ligament attaching below it. Then here we have the biceps tendon. We have the insertion of the bicepital tuberosity. And as we all know, the biceps tendon have another insertion on the fascia of the forearm called Lacertus fibrosis. Um, a brachialis tendon attaches on the uh, olecranon and the ulnar collateral ligament with its various bands attaches from the uh, medial part here to the sublime tubercle with the common flexor tendon on top of it. The annular ligament surrounds the, uh, the annular ligament surrounds the radial neck 
to attach in the anterior and posterior crests of the ulna. Okay, on the axial images, okay, if you don't see the radius, how to know that you are medial? You look for the ulnar nerve. Ulnar nerve is usually lives in the cubital tunnel and it's covered by the uh, overlying aponeurosis. Usually no accompanying muscle between, between this and the subcutaneous uh, fat. We have uh, three joints that we have to interrogate. We have the radiocapitular, ulnar trochlear, and uh, proximal radioulnar joints. On the sagittal image, what do I look for? Uh, I assess for the presence of effusion. I assess also anteriorly the presence uh, or the, the status of the biceps tendon. And in the middle, I look for the pseudo defect of the uh, trochlea and the trochlear cartilage and the uh, cartilage covering the radial head and jumping posteriorly to assess for the uh, triceps tendon. The ulnar collateral ligament is uh, medially located and composed of the anterior bundle, posterior bundle and transverse ligament and it forms the floor of the cubital tunnel and as we see here on the lateral aspect we have components of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament attaching here as a hammock for the head of the, of the, uh, for the radial head. The lateral collateral ligament, you have the radial collateral ligament and the lateral ulnar collateral ligament with the annular ligament surrounding the radial head. Here we can see the presence of the uh, radial nerve, which can be seen between the brachioradialis and brachialis muscles. You can see it as being outlined with fat between the muscles. And the, the most important thing on the axial image is to assess the uh, uh, biceps uh, tendon. We look for the insertion on the uh, uh, bicipital tuberosity and the fascia of the forearm in addition to the uh, assessment posteriorly here of the ulnar nerve. Ulnar nerves usually uh, have a low uh, to intermediate signal intensity in all sequences with uniform thickness with no increased signal intensity. If you have only increased signal intensity without change in caliber, this, this is a normal finding of the ulnar nerve. can be seen also uh, uh, in the ulnar nerve at the level of the Gans canal. If you see just increase in signal intensity without an accompanying thickening or structural changes, that the, this is a normal finding and should not be uh, mistaken for pathology. Here, as in this example here, you can appreciate that there is thickening of the ulnar nerve with intermediate signal intensity with the posterior band of the uh, ulnar collateral ligament. The biceps tendon is routinely assessed on the axial images, but you can do axillary or ancillary imaging planes. It's called FAB's position in which we flex the patient. Uh, elbow and image, the, uh, the uh, biceps tendon in its entire length. Here, you can appreciate the biceps tendon as it courses to insert on the uh, biceptal tuberosity. Here we see the anterior and posterior fat pads. And as you notice here, these fat pads are hidden within the uh, concavities of the distal humerus. If we see joint diffusion, as you know, on X-ray, we'll see the anterior and posterior uh, sail sign. What does it mean? It means that these fat pads have been displaced by the presence of fluid outside these conca concavities. Here, we have a pitfall for uh, the uh, presence of loose body or central osteophyte, the, the uh, ulnar trochlear uh, pseudo loose body. Another uh, pitfall for uh, assessment of the elbow uh, can mimic osteochondral lesion in which you see flattening of the posterior part of the capitellum without an accompanying signal changes. 
this is a normal finding or the pseudo defect of the of the capitella should not be mistaken for uh, osteochondral lesions in the coronal images here you can notice that you have a, a, a triangular shaped uh, synovial fold and this is a normal plica or what's also known as synovial fringe uh, can be taken as a normal variant so injuries of the elbow can uh, injuries can happen in the ligaments tendons muscles and, and nerves with osteochondral injuries but will not cover the latter one for the sake of time the ulnar collateral ligament injury is the primary stabilizer for the elbow and plays a role in the throwing uh, and hitting sports such as uh, baseball, football, and tennis. Additional findings of ulnar collateral ligament injury include strain or rupture of the common flexor tendon, ulnar neuropathy or ulnar traction spurring with heterotopic ossification of the adjacent soft tissues. How does it look like? Basically, you look at the attachment and the appearance of the attachment. If you see it, if you see any fluid filled gap, then this is considered a tear. If it's complete across the whole thickness, then this is complete. If it's leaving some fibers behind, then this is partial thickness tear. Again, medial collateral ligament thickening and, the, and low signal intensity signifying chronic kind of injury. Full thickness ulnar collateral ligament tear. Sometimes we inject these patients with uh, iodinated uh, or uh, intraarticular contrast. You will see contrast leaking across the superior and inferior surface, like uh, what's known as T sign. Okay, you can see, I appreciate here the fluid filled gap. As I said earlier, that we classify uh, injuries in, in threes. Uh, if you see mild edema on both sides, then this is a grade one. Grade two is just thickening without a fluid filled gap, and grade three is a fluid filled gap, as you can see here in this case. Complete tear with a bulging of the ulnar collateral ligament from the sublime tubercle with fluid filled gap. Again, this is a spectrum of the findings. of the uh, radial collateral ligament. You can appreciate here, this is the normal radial collateral ligament with low signal intensity. We have the component of the radial collateral ligament is the radial collateral ligament, annular ligament, and uh, lateral ulnar collateral ligament. The lateral ulnar collateral ligament is the one that is most posterior and uh, uh, progresses distally here to insert on in the posterior part of the ulna and acts as a hammock for to stabilize the radial head. So injuries of the lateral collateral ligament is secondary to acute or chronic repetitive virus stress, causing posterolateral instability with the sprain uh, grading as in the medial collateral ligament. Tear is a discontinuity with the fluid filled gap as we've seen earlier. What's so important about the lateral collateral ligament injury is that sometimes you can have a uh, tennis uh, elbow progressing uh, to involve the uh, uh, extensor carpal radialis previs cranially or the lateral collateral ligament uh, below it with fluid filled gap. As you can notice here, this is the normal insertion, and here it's filled with a gap, filled with fluid, signifying the presence of full thickness tear. Complete radial collateral ligament tear, as you can see here. You don't see the origin or attachment of the radial collateral ligament. You don't see the origin or attachment of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament with significant uh, posterior lateral instability. Lateral epicondylitis, the most important thing is that 
you established the presence of tear in the extensor carpi radialis brevis. Extensor carpi radialis longus is usually arising from the supracondylar ridge here. Usually it is spared initially with uh, lateral epicondylitis. Sometimes if this tear or this tendinosis is left un unchecked, it will progress to tear of the ECRB first, extensor uh, carpi radialis brevis first, then it might progress uh, cranially to involve the extensor carpi radialis longus or inferiorly to involve the radial collateral ligament uh, injury. As you can see here, this is a partial thickness tear of the ECRB in addition to uh, lateral epicondylitis. Here, it has progressed to a significant injury with complete uh, full thickness tear of the longus, brevis, the common extensor tendon, all of them, and the lateral uh, uh, collateral ligament of the uh, elbow. Again, here, an example of uh, lateral epicondylitis with an associated uh, extensive carpi radialis brevis tear. The longus is still slightly tendinopathic here because it originates in the supracondylar ridge. In the common stages, um, if the patient uh, undergoes fibrosis, you will see severe thickening and low signal intensity signifies the presence of severe tendinosis. Medial epicondylitis, on the other hand, involves the common uh, flexor tendon origin. With intermediate signal intensity, it means what? It means tendinosis. If it's filled with the fluid, then this is, uh, you have uh, a component of full thickness tear. Sometimes we see it better on the sagittal images. This is the medial epicondyle, and this is the common flexor tendon origin. If you see focal areas of fluid, it means that there is areas of partial thickness tear. Okay. Uh, quickly now to the biceps tendon. Biceps tendon can uh, be torn in two places. Uh, proximally, usually in, in, in inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, or distally, usually in traumatic due to eccentric uh, muscular contraction. And as you all know, the uh, distal biceps tendon uh, inserts on the bicipital tuberosity of the radius, and another insertion on the uh, fascia of the forearm called the Lacertus fibrosis uh, tears. As we've seen from the previous talks, it's a gap filled with fluid where you expect to see a normal structure. As you can see here, there is a full thickness tear of the tendon with rounded contour. If you see the biceps tendon flying up high like this, it means even the Lacertus fibrosis or the insertion of the fascia has been torn as well. Another example of full thickness bicep stair, but here on an additional sequence, the fab's position. Another example of tear, fluid filled gap with absence of the normal low T2 signal intensity structure. Sometimes we see this kind of lesions surrounding the distal bicep tendon, in which you see a normal tendon, but it is surrounded by a bag of irregular fluid. This is the normal or the uh, bicipital radial bursitis. Usually it's a very small bag of fluid, but when it's distended to this degree, then you'd expect to pre the presence of uh, an additional uh, bursitis. Then again, bicipital radial bursitis, a much lesser uh, uh, grotesque uh, appearance than the previous case another bicipital radial bursitis, usually the causes uh, either mechanical or pertaining to underlying inflammatory um, arthritis such as rheumatoid can present with bicipital radial bursitis. The location is pretty characteristic. It surrounds the distal biceps tendon. 
Here are an, another example of anterior tendon pathology or anterior muscle pathology. Here, this is the biceps muscle. As you can see here, the myotendinous junction is normal. The muscle bulk and signal intensity is normal. And below it, you see a severely enlarged brachialis muscle with feathery appearance. And as you notice here, the brachialis muscle inserts on the proximal uh, ulna. So brachialis muscle rupture or grade three strain can look like this. Triceps tendon is uncommonly injured, but usually in a similar fashion to the, to the uh, uh, rest of the tendons, you can have partial thickness tear, you can have tendinosis, you can have full thickness tear in a similar kind of concept. Um, the, uh, uh, you have a bag of fluid here overlying the biceps, uh, the olecranon process, usually indicating the accompanying uh, uh, olecranon bursitis, as you can see here in this case. Here, you have bursitis in addition to fluid-filled gap. A normal, the normal triceps tendon is completely replaced by a bag of fluid indicating chronic tear. Uh, in uh, some patients who have especially mechanical causes or underlying deposition disease such as gout, you can have uh, bicipitoradial or uh, olecranon uh, uh, bursitis, which is basically a fluid-filled structure with peripheral enhancement and post-contrast administration. You, sometimes you'll see mild subchondral bone edema here as reactive process. This is a much more grotesque example of olecranon uh, porzitis with fluid filled gap structure with no discontinuity of the triceps indicating olecranon porzitis. No adjacent subchondral bone marrow signal changes were demonstrated in this case. A quick word about ulnar neuropathy. We see it uh, quite commonly, usually because of mechanical causes. But sometimes you can have a normal variant that can predispose uh, the patient towards ulnar neuritis. Usually the ulnar nerve, as you can see here, is in the cubital tunnel with a covering retinaculum. And this is uh, covered immediately by subcutaneous fat. Uh, you shouldn't see any other muscles. If you see muscle here, then this patient have a normal muscle variant. It's called anconius epitrochlearis, accessory anconius epitrochlearis muscle, and can predispose towards ulnar nerve compression in the cubital tunnel. Another example of accessory anconius uh, epitrochlearis compressing the ulnar nerve. But the, the, the one thing that you keep, keep in mind regarding ulnar neuritis and ulnar neuropathy is that you can have normally increased signal intensity or increased T2 signal intensity in the cubital tunnel without structural changes. The other normal location for this manifestation is at the level of the wrist joint. You shouldn't uh, be overcalling that as uh, neuritis or neuropathy. So personally speaking, I call it as neuropathy whenever I see focal change in caliber in addition to the signal changes. And this concludes the elbow. Uh, we're left with the spine. Uh, it's going to be much, much uh, shorter than the previous. I think from the orthopedic interest, I think the discs are uh, bears the most uh, importance. So this is probably one of the most important uh, papers that you should uh, be all uh, familiar with. Uh, basically, it's a task force uh, committee formed by multiple societies, prominent societies, in North America in order to unify the nomenclature and have a common uh, language between different services regarding disc pathology. I think this is, has been adopted by uh, American Society of Neuroradiology, American Society of uh, uh, Spine Radiology, and the American uh, North American Spine Society. So I urge it's freely available online and it's um, very accessible, very readable. Type. Normally here, uh, let's identify the sequences very quickly. Here, 
This is a, a subcutaneous fat is white. So this is a non-fat suppressed image. Then you look at an area with expect fluid where this is the central spinal canal containing the CSF, which is white. So this is a T2 image here because the central CSF is dark. Then this is a T1 image. Okay. Because the discs are very well hydrated, you will see it lighting up on the T2 weighted images. This is the normal disc. So once they undergo dehydration, then the, you are going to have replacement of the central part by dark material without changing in the volume. Then as the dehydration develops, you're going to have reduction of the volume and eventually you're going to have a bone on bone appearance. As you notice here, the periphery of the disc is low signal intensity material because it's called the annulus fibrosis. Usually it's made by uh, fibrous tissue. Sometimes you can have high signal intensity here and this is called annular fissure. Annular fissure can be painful because the outer part of the disc is innervated by Sharpie's, uh, is made up by Sharpie's fibers, which carries nerve endings. So this is probably gonna hear us in, in, in our reports uh, very much. You are gonna have uh, diffuse disc bulge. If you have one, one yeah, disc material is extending more than 180 degrees beyond the underlying osseous margin. If this is extending on both sides, symmetrically, I will call it as diffuse disc bulge. If it's going to one side more than the other side, I will call it as asymmetrical disc bulge. So the word bulge, you should reserve it if the disc material is extending more than 180 degrees, uh, more than the adjacent end plate. Then uh, for in terms of the nomenclature, we have uh, uh, in the cross section or in the axial images, we have the central zone, uh, the subarticular zone, the foraminal zone, and extra foraminal or far lateral zones. Why this is important? Because the central zone will compress the traversing or the nerves, the descending nerves, and the exiting nerves have been uh, uh, spared from this compression. Unless you have a subarticular or foraminal zone or extra foraminal, you have a same level uh, compression as the level of the disc. Again, the classification can be pertaining to the disc level, uh, uh, suprapedicular, pedicular liver, or infrapedicular livers, especially if you have uh, superior or inferior migration. Uh, disc degeneration can be just dehydration or annular tear. Protrusion, if you have the disc material or nucleus fibrosis, uh, nucleus bulbosus extending uh, with a configuration that is uh, wider than uh, higher. If the, if the uh, protrusion progresses into uh, a material that is uh, higher than wider, then you are dealing with extrusion. Sequestration, basically, if you have a separated uh, disc material from the parent disc. Like, why the importance of these uh, distinctions? Because protrusion usually can have a chance in conservative treatment, while extrusion is extremely difficult uh, for it to return to its normal status. Again, this is this uh, difference between disc protrusion and disc extrusion. Disc protrusion, we're going to have a uh, disc material that is uh, wider than higher. Uh, disc protrusion or extrusion can undergo migration if it goes up or down uh, the end plate level. If, it's, if it gets separated from the parent disc, then this can be called uh, sequestration. And when I give contrast, it doesn't enhance on post-contrast administration. This is, a, again, an example of disc extrusion. It's taller than, high, uh, than wider on the, uh, on the uh, axial or even the sagittal images. It doesn't matter. Here, an example of foraminal disc extrusion. You can see the low signal intensity material filling the disc, uh, the neural foramen and compressing the exiting nerve at the same level. Again, disc extrusion. And here we have a component of cranial migration. 
far lateral when, whenever you see it beyond the border of the superior articular facet of the below uh, level, then this is a far lateral protrusion and also compresses the same level of the uh, protrusion. Again, far lateral and another far lateral disc protrusion. Synovial cyst, this is a very interesting uh, disease process in which you will see a ganglion cyst emanating from an adjacent degenerative facet joint arthropathy. If it goes posterior, no one cares about it because it doesn't compress anything posteriorly. But if it goes anterior, it will go preferentially to the uh, lateral recesses and compresses the traversing uh, nerves. As you can see here in this case, you have facet joint arthropathy with uh, irregularity of the articular surface and a fluid filled structure communicating with the degenerative facet joint indicating uh, synovial cyst. Here is a case that I had. A disc protrusion can happen posteriorly, but in very rare, rare circumstances can happen anteriorly as well, as you can see here in this case. The disc material has extruded completely anteriorly. It doesn't compress anything here, but the patient will probably have pain because of the end plate bone marrow edema. Again, sometimes you can see disc herniation or disc bulge in, a, in company to additional findings contributing to the central canal narrowing. You can appreciate here that this is the ligamentum flavum uh, resulting along with the disc bulge into severe central canal stenosis. As you notice here, you can barely notice any uh, coda equina nerves. But another thing that you probably see us uh, mentioning quite commonly in our reports, the Schmoll's nodule. Basically, this herniation can be anterior, as you've seen probably previously, can be posterior to the central canal or the, uh, the far lateral aspect, or the disc material can herniate into the substance of the uh, adjacent vertebra through an end plate defect. As you can see here in this case, there is a focal bone defect in the superior end plate of L3. And as you notice here on the T2 fat sat image, that the uh, defect is filled with, uh, with uh, disc material. This usually doesn't cause any symptom and no one cares about it, but sometimes these patients will present in the acute stage. In the acute stage, can present with end plate edema. And you probably, as you all know, bone marrow edema per se is painful. Why it's painful? Because usually the periosteum of the bone is sensitive to touch, but the endosteum uh, that lines the inner part of the bones is sensitive to pressure. So any, any, any increase in intraosseous pressure will lead to uh, patient symptoms. And as you notice here, the focal defect, and there is this material plunging into this defect in keeping with uh, acute Schmoll's nodule. Of course, if you have a patient who had like a history of previous metastatic disease, care should be taken to exclude underlying uh, malignancy or malignant uh, vertebral metastatic disease by either giving contrast material or, uh, or uh, even resorting to uh, CT guided uh, lumbar biopsy. Uh, Schmoll's nodule can happen at multiple end levels, and usually this is related to end plate uh, osteochondrosis. Um, if this is accompanied by increased kyphotic, kyphotic deformity, we we'll label it as Schumerman's disease. Spondylodiscitis, end plates usually um, have a uniform signal intensity, but whenever you see fluid in the gap, without a distinct disc material, with accompanying end plate edema and erosions, you think immediately of spondylodiscitis. Regardless, is it sterile spondylodiscitis that you see with ankylosing spondylitis or spondylarthropathies in general, or an infective spondylodiscitis? All can look the same.
this was an infective uh, discitis because of uh, an underlying UTI. Like congenital lumbar fusion. How did I know that this is congenital? Because look at the vertebral body waist. It is much more constricted in comparison to the level above. And this happens when you, whenever you see congenital fusion of vertebral bodies. As you notice here, posterior elements, there is osseous bridging. So what's the significance of the congenital osseous bridging or congenital block vertebra? It's that it's going to act as a rigid segment, as the segments that you get fixed with, with, with spinal fixations, be it in the cervical or lumbar region. The fixed segment is going to mechanically overload the level uh, above or below. leading to accelerated degenerative disc disease or what's known as adjacent segment degeneration. As you see here, you have severe degenerative disc disease at uh, L3-4 and L5 S1 levels. Here, another example of extra foraminal disc protrusion. You have the disc material. Why did I say that this is protrusion? Notice that the width is much higher or much taller or much wider than its uh, height, okay? If you notice here, this is the exiting nerve, okay? The exiting nerve is here. If we draw a transverse line like this, these two should lie within the same line. Since this is lying posterior, it means that this nerve has been compressed by an extra foraminal disc protrusion. Another example, of disc uh, extrusion with peculiar appearance here that this is uh, sometimes we can see a mild accompanying epidural hematoma. How did I, did I know that this is an epidural hematoma? Basically look at the T1 image. If you see uh, in the epidural space, something that is intermediate signal intensity, keep in mind the presence of epidural hematoma provided that it is not the same signal intensity as the adjacent but uh, this is an example of an elderly patient presented with dysphagia. You notice here the patient doesn't does have multiple disc disease with bulky anterior ostipites. So this is a typical appearance of this disease process, what's known as diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. What's the significance of this disease? The significance is that 25% of these patients have an accompanying ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament here, posteriorly. Not seen in this case, but in 25% in of patients will have an accompanying OPLL entity. So OPLL usually is problematic because it uh, further complicates and compresses the central canal. So quick word about the cervical spine. What's so special of the, about the cervical spine? The cervical spine uh, carries a, a variation or a variance to the thoracic and lumbar levels in which you have the uncovertebral joints. What's the uncovertebral joint? It's basically the joint between two adjacent vertebral bodies. Okay, so these joints, when undergoes degeneration, it will produce ostifites with the preferential uh, areas to compress the neural foramen. So here, this is the uncovertebral joint of one, one side, and the other is one. This is the uncovertebral joint for it. If you notice here, this is the what's left of the neural foramen in comparison to the contralateral side. So this patient presented with uh, radic radiculopathy. Well, in this case here, there is a problem in the cervical spine, but notice here, you have a soft disc. How did I know that this is a soft disc, not uh, uh, unostified because it has an intermediate signal intensity on uh, the gradient image. Okay, and this is how we differentiate between uh, soft disc and the ostifites. In gradient, usually it's dark, 
and the and soft disk is usually intermediate on gradient images. Again, this is the disk protrusion. Here, again, as I said earlier, not every uh, epidural high T1 signal intensity means epidural hematoma. You can see here these uh, white structures. When I do fat suppression, it's taken out or completely fat, uh, fat is suppressed, signifying the presence of epidural fat. Sometimes we can see uh, increased epidural fat in patients with uh, obesity, patients with chronic steroid use. We can see epidural lipomatosis. And with this, uh, I conclude this talk. I think uh, probably one of the most comprehensive presentations ever. Uh, wish you all sweet dreams. And uh, the floor is open for any questions. Uh, I'll be more than happy to answer. I just want to say thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for your all hard work on this lecture. And I really appreciate the contribution you have made. Sure. Uh, my contacts. Um... Usually, you can find me on Twitter on double uh, A L J E F R I, and that's the only account I have. Yeah. So just type it here. Apologize for the probably uh, you've seen more radiologists than 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 ortho and uh, usually these kind of talks are geared towards uh, radiology resident. This is the first time I've given to dedicated ortho uh, audience. So apologies for any mishaps and probably we can uh, have uh, feedback for uh, to restructure uh, other. Uh, this talk in the future, inshallah. Yeah, I'll send it to Dr. Abdul Malik and uh, after I convert it to PDF, inshallah. It seems that there is no question, so. I bid you for farewell and uh, good night, everyone. Thank you for attending. Allah yatik al afi, Dr. Ahmed. Dr. Ahmed, bis and kinti bitik to in one of Twitter or Haj, ekta barheen. Ekta bar sikri nahsan. Okay, I'll put it here. It's, uh, this is my Twitter account and this is my email if there is anything I can help with. Hopefully it's clear. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. For our uh, guests and audience, uh, you can contact us on Twitter on Learning Curve, uh, and please feel free, feel free to write your uh, suggestions for any lecture. Topics uh, you you would uh, like us to present today. We was uh, with uh, Doctor uh, Ahmed Al Jeffrey, his consultant, in uh, King Fahad Medical City uh, in Riyadh. He has uh, a consultant radiologist. Thank you very much. We we did finish our uh, lecture today on skin. You can find uh, Doctor Ahmed. Uh, uh, on Twitter, and you can find his uh, email. You can write it or you can take a screenshot. 
to contact uh, with him. Thank you very much again.